there there are people, you know, out there in the world, real role players out there in the hip hop community who would have enough influence to, you know, create a type of space like this for a bunch of rappers or, you know, just people in the industry, thought leaders, speakers to come together and for us to have some type of just collective thought direction of, where, of, of, of how we want the culture to be viewed and how we want it to be preserved and, you know what I'm saying, where we see it going. I just feel like it's time for that. A hundred percent. You know, that's, for me, if like in, in real life, that's really part of my mission, like, as a whole. That's why I call myself a thought leader. It's teaching this direction of thinking. You right. know what I mean? Leading us in the right way. Like, what's going on here? Well, let me tell Pushing you how to think. Pushing these plans to the sun, man. I appreciate my pops for teaching me how to be a guy. From a boy to a man and ultimately back into the natural state of being into a guy. As guys, we're supposed to always move with that higher self. And I had to be able to execute it. Having knowledge is not power. The execution of knowledge is power. Knowledge makes a man unfit to be a slave. Because the only real knowledge you can get is knowledge of self. The highest level is power. The highest level is sovereignty. The highest level is higher consciousness. The highest level is we own our own culture. Excellence at a very high level. Not high level. Mm. A high I like that. It's time for a high level conversation. Yeah. We're here for another high level another conversation. High level conversation. Nineteen keys and this is a high level conversation. Tap in with the guy. Peace family is nineteen keys with another high level conversation today. As all days, you know, on high level, we always have very powerful supreme beings on this show. Um, today's guest is no exception to that rule, especially as we manufacture in ourselves going on tour to the highest level. And this is the season finale episode, actually. So coming to a close of season two, wanted to make sure somebody who I believe represents duality, right? Um, myself growing up in Oakland, California, and being a thought leader, but also coming from the streets and different enterprises of thought, I see myself, you know, multi-dimensional, right? And it's the same way I see this brother in regards to the way he presents himself, the way he designs himself, his artistry, his craft, and the way he wants to be presented. Because a lot of times there's a difference between the way you know yourself and the way that the world sees yourself. The world often can only put you in one box because people have been trained to only recognize things from one way. In survival, we have to be able to recognize things from a pattern, from a stripe, from a color if you're in the jungle. So it's easy to just put somebody in the box real quick to say that that's who they are so that it's easier for you, but that does not mean that's who they truly are when you look at the vastness of their character and what they represent. This powerful good brother band, weighing out of Flatbush, I believe that's important to note because there's a lot of history that comes from that cultural background and context, especially when it comes to hip hop, especially when it comes to consciousness and when it comes to putting out political messages, right? And things of that nature. The good brother Joey Badass has been on my radar for a long time, right? Because I've seen, you know, or listened rather to his music and it represented, you know, a continuation, the continuum of that spirit that hip hop was created from in the first place. And I believe people that come out that region, they usually hold it down to make sure that that's not left, regardless of where they go in the world and how they transform and continue their presence of the art and the craft. So not only has this good brother made it within the musical realm, but also now the acting chops is on the block as well. Been in movies that have actually made Oscars or won Oscars rather, and now has one of my favorite characters, the anti-hero, which the brother plays very well, so it definitely had to be a past character within his life. And, you know, the brother is out here, you know, I seen him on stage, and the presence that he commanded on stage, I feel like, was me watching the evolution, right? And the setting of standing up there, and he was, he was uh, rapping, and then there was some song and some rhythm in it at the same time. And that, to me, was representing the evolution of Joey Badass, coming back to music and making some of what I think is his greatest music during this time, because I feel like it really represents the multidimensional aspects of his character and what he's always wanted to showcase to the world. And that's the beauty of when you allow people to flourish into who they really are, rather than box people, you get to see who they really are. 
And I really want to have a conversation on the birthing process of yourself to the world because we go through iterations and phases. We don't just come out fully formed. So today I have none other than the great young God, Joy Badass. Appreciate you, King. Yes, sir. <laughs> That was uh that was one hell of an intro. Man, I gotta fly these off the top. We gotta just come to me. That I can't was, write these things. That was one hell of an intro. I need you to write me a bio. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't never been introduced so well. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, my mom would be proud of that right there. Man, appreciate it, man. Appreciate you for being here, man. No doubt. Thanks um, for having me. Yeah. You know, I posted the video and I kinda teased like, it'd be a good conversation I've had with Joey Badass and everybody's like, hell yeah, you need to have a brother on the show. Yeah. You know, I told you the first time I met you at BET Awards, you know, you represent something in hip hop, right? It's like, I always look at the guests and I say, if you take them out of whatever they're doing, what's left, right? Like how many branches fall, right? And I feel like there's not too many young, uh, uh, young guys in the space right now that represent you know, you say true hip hop, whatever connotation a person is connected to it, they attribute that. When I say true hip hop, I'm really talking about the principles and the values and the consciousness that goes into it, the creativity, the rhythm, the multi-sensory effect. And you represent that very well, right? So I really want to get a little more of, you know, what do you believe is your mission as far as your representation, you know what I mean, in hip hop and music? Well, you know, at the very basic level of it, I feel my mission is to inspire others, especially the forthcoming generations. You know what I'm saying? Um, I feel like there's a Tupac quote that always resonated with me. Like he said, he doesn't know if, if he'll be the one to change the world, but he can guarantee that he will spark a mind that will. You know, that always resonated with me because I feel like I carry that in a way, you know what I'm saying, is I'm here to do my piece, to make my contribution, and in everything that I do that I fight for, the integrity that I reserve for myself, I hope that that stands as a as a good example for, you know, those to come, you know what I'm saying, especially young black men like myself. Yes, sir. You know, if if, if there's a there's a uh, book called, I think it's called the, the Book of Stillness or something, Stillness Speaks. If if there was a hurricane outside and you looked at the middle of the eye of that hurricane and you could see, let's say, like a steel pole just dead in there, right? It allows you to be able to concentrate and you can see focus and there's an art in the stillness of reality. And there's a stillness that human beings gather regardless of the storm of life that's going on. There's always a stillness, like a standing pole, you know what I mean, in the midst of it all that they can stay centered. And that's necessary in the industry. That's necessary in life because there's always things going on. So what keeps you centered? Because, you know, if I'm, I'm a good read of energy and my around people, of course, you have a good center of balance, I believe. And I believe part of that comes from the authenticity of knowing yourself. For sure. I'll say what mainly keeps me centered is family. You know, those that I love um, and, you know, who ultimately love me, you know, being close with them and being able to connect with them. Uh, you know, it's funny because even in the pandemic, it was like a blessing for me in disguise that time because I really got the opportunity to, you know, connect with my loved ones and really spend time with them and to, you know, grow with them and to ultimately water different relationships that, like, you know, I, I hold near and dear close to my heart, you know what I'm saying? And so I, I, I want to say, you know, that and you know, just my spiritual journey um, as a man, as just an individual, you know what I'm saying? Like waking up and pointing to myself, like, you know, trying to pray every day, trying to keep my mind full with new ideas and, um, you know, maintaining a healthy diet, you know what I'm saying? Not just what I eat, but like, you know, everything that I consume and things like yeah, that. Yeah, spiritual journey is tough, man, because, you know, we, we don't live in a very spiritual world, right? This world is increasingly going away from spiritual things, right? Uh, technology advances, but man doesn't, right? And that's sort of at the point where we are right now where technology is constantly outpacing the growth of man, right? And man looks at the consequence of technological advancement and he thinks that he's growing, but he's really not, right? Your ability to think, your ability to concentrate, your ability to have just really good mental and spiritual health. You understand me? Like for me, maintaining sanity is... <laughs> You know, it's a daily fight, you know, because 
You live in a world where you know it doesn't represent you and you still have to go out in that world every single day, right? And if you be too much of yourself, right, then the world to start attacking you will be against you. So the balance of maintaining authenticity, you know, is a spiritual and a mental balance as well, right? Like growing up in the hoods of America, the most toughest gangster men that I know, they go through that crisis of that right there. Of like, damn, I can't even show up in my real self because the rest of the world looks like that is vulgar. You understand me? Because we are so calledly past the time where it's celebrated, you know what I mean, to be yourself and authenticity. You feel me? So that's another battle that I feel is key. So when I hear you talk about spiritual journey, I really want to unlock that a bit as far as what goes into the ideology of, you know, your spiritual journey. Well, you know, firstly, is this realization, right? This ultimate realization of understanding that you have to seek internally. You know what I'm saying? It's more about an internal retreat. And, you know, going to your point about like the world that we live in today, everything is so external. You know what I'm saying? Like people put an emphasis on these things that are outside of, of ourselves, which are like, you know, symbols of power or success or whatever it may be that like, you know, drives a person's desire, you know, you, you know what I'm saying? So um, it's definitely about understanding that firstly and, you know, making sure that you keep yourself on that path of maintaining your own individual internal power and filling your own cup, you know what I'm saying? Like not waking up and the first thing you're doing is jumping on your phone and scrolling around and seeing what's going on out there. Like, let's see what's going on inside first, you know what I mean? And then from there, it's like a rabbit hole. You know, you start to dive in and, because when you're in that space, you know, so much beautiful things can happen. You like literally hear things, you see things, you know what I mean? You get hunches and you follow intuition. And you know, these things, I, I believe that everybody's path is unique. Like one of the main lessons that I'm learning in life right now is that you have to give everyone their own time to have their own realizations. You know what I'm saying? I, I, and I know you can relate to this because you know, I feel like people like us, we get so excited when we get introduced to new information that, you know, we immediately apply to ourselves and it helps us advance and evolve. And it's like the first thing we want to do is share that with our loved ones. Like, yo, let me put you on, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's funny because I learned an interesting life lesson from the real version of this plant, which is, which is called a bird of paradise, right? So like when these are sprouting new leaves, they're kind of like rolled up like this and you could like see them coming through so my first plant like I'm, I'm like a whole green thumb type of dude now. so like i got like 50 house plants or, or something like that like anyway so my first joint that i had my first bird bird of paradise that i had i got so excited when i was seeing like you know it sprouted no leaves that i try to unravel it you know because like i'm waiting like two weeks and i'm like yo why does joint want to unravel maybe it needs some help <laughs> you know what i'm saying and, I'm I'm so excited for its growth and so and, and, and its progression that I, I unraveled it for it. The next day that that leaf died. You know what I'm saying? And it, it taught me a valuable lesson. Like right there, I was like, damn, I do that with people all the time. Shit, man. I think that's that's a part of the story of my life. I mean, I got seven brothers, uh, two sisters, and you know, I, I grew up in a tough love environment where I'm not a person that Growing up my whole life, I've never been comfortable with seeing people where they at because I can see their potential. So I've always been the type of person, like you say, try to unroll them like, yo, I know you right here, right? It's hard for me to be satisfied with you being content with where you are, knowing where you could be. You know what I'm saying? But you got to realize that, you know, just because you can see it for a person don't mean that that person can see it for themselves. And also, if you try to push a person before they're ready, you can put them into a position that can be detrimental to them, right? So like handling your own power, like human beings, we so powerful, we come up with a million philosophies to humble ourselves and to tell ourselves why we not powerful because it's very hard to control all this power, right? The ego, it, it, it exposes you in two different ways. It can give you a false illusion of our reality or it can give you the real truth for yourself. And all you wanna do out there is show people your truth. Yo, I'm this, I'm that, I'm the third. And it's everybody you meet and everything that you do you exposing who you are to everybody. Everybody ain't ready for that. You understand me? Like humility for me is only showing people the parts that they need to see. That they ready for, yeah. essentially. You, you know, know what I mean? Like, I, it's, it's like if you're training somebody, like you can go up there, let's say you can hit 300. You go up there, 
you may discourage somebody like, damn, man, I'll never get up there. But if you could have went up there and just worked out with them and you could have helped usher in their confidence and their belief with themselves, then they would have been like, all right, this is possible. You do just a little bit out there around. You have to understand the rhythm and the pace of developing yeah. people. No, that's a fact. It's like, you know, back to the plant analogy. So instead of like, you know, unraveling the leaves now, I just point them to the sun. You know what I'm saying? Like I just put them in the sun. I I, I make sure they watered and, and you know what I'm saying? The play, other some I play some music yeah, for them. Play some music for them. You know they did that experiment. Mess. You play music to plants and it helped them grow 20% more. Oh, really? Yeah, you got to be like some Mozart music. Well, that makes sense because, Good you know, they say though. you talk to your plants and yeah. everything. It, it, I mean, you know, if you listen to the Mozart effect, is, it's a particular song, but mostly all Mozart music, you listen to it for more than 10 minutes and it increases your reasoning, your spatial intelligence and IQ. You know what I mean? So that's the that's the beauty of, like, you know, music and things of that nature is that frequency and energy, you know what I'm saying, and the power of music and you know, even from the pace of music, it increases our heartbeat, right? Slower pace of music slows down our heartbeat, you know? So music has such a powerful hip out of control. And so like, I respect people that put something into their music because you got people at a very vulnerable state. You can grow them or you can slow them. I've always said that like, I believe that music is the most powerful force in the world next to love. And you know, you could also channel love through music. But, you know, that being said, I've always felt a sense of responsibility when it came to my art form. Because, you know, I know how influential it is. I strong, like, the type of music I listened to growing up, without a doubt, had an effect on the man I became today. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, I got a wide range of music, but at the same time, like, you know, my selection was very selective, you know? And um, that ultimately molded my mind. So for me as an artist today, I try to repay that debt to society. Like, you know what I'm saying? I want to give these kids something that can play a season in mind to that, that'll grow, you know what I'm saying? And that'll flourish and that'll push them, ultimately, you know, fulfilling what my purpose is. You know, giving them, giving them life in my words and not death. Right. And that's, that's key because there's a lot of deaf music that's out there. And Everybody don't want to accept a role, you know, like you a role model if you in that role. You know what I mean? Whether people are modeling themselves after the discipline of who you are and it's developing them in good terms or developing a negative. Bad, yeah, for sure. You may not want to take the side effects, you know what I mean, of your influence and take responsibility for it. So you may try to place that on a parent or anybody else, but you don't even realize you have more power a lot of times over a child than their own parents. You know what I mean? Or a young mind, and that's really what we talking about, a younger mind. You play into the imagination. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Like, when kids see celebrities or whatnot on TV, it's part of their imagination. It's part of their fantasy. You know what I'm saying? They dreaming to be like this person. You know what I'm saying? They seeing this person in their dreams. Yeah. They, hey, <laughs> they're you know imagining dream about me, man? They're, they're imagining how you're <laughs> saying. You know what I mean? Great. They imagine Listen, how the dream unreal. don't mean nothing, okay? <laughs> Relax. <laughs> like I saw you in the dream, roll on ball. I mean, let's I definitely like to travel. I'll say that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know you astral travel too. I think I heard you say something about your astral travel abilities, man. A little bit. I won't say that like, you know. I'm like a diamond medallion <laughs> member or something like that. You feel me? But I got some miles. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I got some miles in for it's sure. Just a little Uber Astro traveling. Yeah. You know what I'm I don't know if I can walk into the Sky Club just yet, but you know, my you know. This episode is brought to you by Goldwater. Now, I talked about this before, like my, me believing that I, I astro travel as a child, like in the story of like when I, I grabbed some money on my dream before, like. It was, I had some money in the dream and I held on it so tight. Listen, people ain't got to believe me, but, <laughs> yeah, but this is what that it money. is. I woke up, that money was there. <laughs> and as a grown man, the memory is 100% real. You know what I'm saying? But it's like... How much money was it? I don't even know. I know it was some cents, some chains, and some dollars. It really? Probably, yeah. That's was, crazy. And that's why I was like... And I believe it, had a, it was a gold coin. That's why I was so excited too. But I just remember like... And I was trying to do it on purpose. Like... I, I gotta keep this because yeah, the yeah, feeling yeah. of having it felt so good. I didn't want to wake up without it. Right. You know, and, and, and ever since then, I tried to do it, but it didn't work like that. You know what I'm saying? But I, I truly believe in the ability to, you know, go outside yourself, right? Like your body is not a prison, right? Like your mind doesn't exist within your body, right? 
This is just the way we localize, you know, our ideas of reality, right? When we think about time, we think about life, all of these things, our senses can fool us because it helps us, you know, go through life with this train of thought to where it's not too much going on. Yeah, but for me, you know, I like to travel a lot in my own mind, you know what I'm saying? Like, and my whole goal right now is to get people to realize their power, right? Like, it's a story of this magical stone in this village where was this kid named Reveal. And Reveal heard about this old man that had this ability that everybody that went and grabbed this magical stone, all of a sudden they get a completely like new mind. They can see the world in a completely different light. You know, so Reveal, like he, he was skeptic though. He was like, man, ain't no way he giving y'all this insight. Y'all just going and touching this stone. So, but he decided to go check it out anyway, cause he was curious. So he go to the old man in the village and he say, listen, I want to try the stone. Right, and he said, I heard that it's gonna give me a completely new mind and allow me to see things I've never seen before. And he's like, yeah, everything is true. He said, all you gotta do is grab that stone right there. So he picked it up, you know what I mean? A little open-minded, still skeptic. And he grabbed the stone, he said, first, I need you to close your eyes, but when you open it, it's gonna be different. You're gonna see the world differently. So he grabbed a stone, closed his eyes. Then all of a sudden, all these visions started to come to him. He started to, what he thought was like seeing in different dimensions. He could see what the future world would look like. He could see what his future self looked like. Like he could see everything completely different. You know what I mean? And so when he opened his mind, he was shocked. Like, how did that work? You know what I mean? And the old man said, it don't work. That's just a regular stone. He said, the power the whole time was in you to imagine something different, mm. right? Your mind has that capability. Right. The stone just helps you, you know, uh, um, create that power of belief within self. Right. And he said, everybody that came here before you came here was for the same thing, and I told them the same thing. Like some type of totems. And when he walked out there, he told everybody, yeah, bro gave me a new mind. I see the world completely different now. Yeah. You know, and there's so many people that don't have growth mindset, so many people that don't access the limits of their own abilities. So we live in one of the greatest times on the planet Earth, but people ain't walking around living like it. You know what I mean? You can easily turn a, a liability into an asset by the way you perceive it, right? So it's like, you know, people can be liabilities until you give them, you know, a job, you give them a vision, right? It's like technology can be a liability until you're using it for efficiency. Right, until you're utilizing it. Right. Social media. Same Social shit. media. Yeah. So for me, being at your highest level is, is having a realization. It ain't chasing nothing. It ain't fighting nothing. It's just realizing, like, the most beautiful thing on the planet Earth, one of the most powerful things we have is the placebo effect. We believe it. We can change our biological structure. We can cure ourselves. But... Doctors give people police placebo effect to activate the mind. That's all. You know what I mean? So as a teacher, you know, as a, as a thought leader, my goal is just to activate you. That's it. Just to get you to thinking. Spark. Just to get you to use yourself. Right, right. <laughs> just to ignite that spark. <laughs> you know, I, I'm sure it's times where you can see yourself, you know, kind of in the third, like, I'm about to use Joey Badass to go on there and get this. You know what I mean? Because even when you take on you know, uh, and when you become known to the world, you become this entity, right, or or deity that people know. And it's like you have control over that thing. You can build it up, you can design it, you can change the image of it, you know, you can create a better life to live through that, right? So what's that process for you? Like, current Joey Badass is not the same that got in the game, right? You or a much higher level version of yourself. If you could have looked at yourself when you first started and be like, that's my future self, bro, cool as hell. What are you doing? You feel me? Like, what's that iteration and process of self-development? Yeah, I mean, looking at it from then till now, right? So I was always an ambitious kid to start off. You know, I was the only child. The way I was raised, I found myself with a lot of free time. You know, free time in a long time. So with this a long time, you know, I, I, I expressed myself through different art forms and, you know, started experimenting. And I always had this vision that I'd be who I was. Like, you know, I'd be a musician, that I'd be an actor, that I'd be, you know, expressing myself in this type of way in the world that I would be successful. Like I, I knew from a very young age, I said to myself, I'll be a millionaire by 21. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what it was in me that just really believed in that with perfect faith. You know what I'm saying? And so it so it was. So it manifested. 
But it was an interesting time in my life when I turned 25, because I realized that I, I didn't visualize life past that. You know, like I honestly didn't, I didn't see myself living that long. You know, I just didn't think about it. You know what I'm saying? I'm like 21 and there's, you know, life is a roller coaster. You know what I'm saying? And that really, it was an epiphany. It was a, it was a breakthrough point in my life because right then and there, I, pl I visualized my shit out to 40. You know what I'm saying? Like I wrote my plan. I wrote my 20 year plan out. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, let me, let me now, let me, let me start applying. Let me start building this vision for myself, this journey, this path. Let me start building it from now to, to ensure where I'm going. You know what I'm saying? Cause I never want to be unsure. I never want to be like misguided. I always want to, you know, have my purpose and my sense of direction. You know what I'm saying? So. That is definitely something that, you know, I take heed to. I got these things written down. I got these ideas and these plans for myself and uh, 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 time limits in, in which I want to accomplish them by, you know what I'm saying? And it's, these things serve as like my North Star. Yeah. You know, I think that, that that's powerful because um, I got, you know, a lot of goals. I've surpassed a lot of different things and sometimes very rarely I surprise myself. And I say very rarely because, you know, I have a big idea of the way I see myself. You put a lot, you put a lot of pressure on yourself. Right. You know what and, I'm saying? And, and, it is, and I, that's one thing I want people to know. It is, it's real pressure. You know what I'm saying? Like, but I like the darkness. We was all born in the darkness. You know what I mean? That's where you give birth. You know, so for me, you know, where I exist at in the world and where I exist, I know my place. You feel me? And when you know where you at, you know how you can move exactly from there. Some people don't know their place. They don't know exactly where they at right now. So if you, it's like when you try to give yourself directions, you press that little arrow button and then let you know where you are, the then it gives you directions from there. The and exit. there's so many people can't pinpoint where they at in life. You know what I mean? So they don't know how to create a vision for where to go from where they at. It's very true. And you know, it's funny because I created this structure, you know what I'm saying? I call it the mind, but it's like my own little structure that I've created and I've tweaked it over the years. I even created some for friends. You know, and, and what it does is, it's kind of like this. I feel like life or from a mental standpoint is like we're on a plane, right? Most people, when they get on the plane, what they do? Go to sleep, look at the entertainment. The Nobody on the, on the plane, that's the passengers are actually concerned about where we are on the map. You know what I'm saying? Like nobody is looking at the radar. It's, even some people are checking yeah, like, where we at? Like, got that shit up there. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it was like, we always, have an idea of where we're going, what the destination is, but we it's rare that we actually know where we're at. It's rare that we actually want to get up out of our seats and go to the cockpit and be the pilot. Right, right. You know what I'm saying? Decide like, okay, we're going to fly it this way. You know, and the structure that I created is a way that like, I kind of minimize and maximize my goals. And what I mean by that is, I feel like uh, as human beings, we all want like these big shiny goals. You know what I mean? Like we always write our goals as if somebody gonna look in our little black book or somebody peeking over our shoulder like, these goals better look sexy on yeah, paper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? So it's like a lot of the times we miss out on the opportunity to build rapport with ourselves. You know what I mean? So that's where you minimize, right? Okay, cool, we all want a million dollars. But let's look at it from a practical standpoint. How much money we made last year? Okay, say you made fifty thousand dollars. You gonna have to multiply your output to the world by at least eleven, twelve, thirteen, fifteen times in a year. Like, let's be realistic. <laughs> let's be realistic. So, okay, you know, now let's 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 chop it. Okay, yeah, of course, a million dollars is the goal. But the way I look at it is, I set these more like bite-sized action items or tasks. You know what I'm saying? So, if you want to get a million dollars, let's make the goal. Uh, $150,000 this year, you know what I'm saying? That way, if everything stays just the way it is, you know you're gonna make 50,000, so you know you gotta push yourself at least 1.5 times. You know what I'm saying? To hit your goal. That's realistic, and then I minimize it even more. Okay, what has to be accomplished this month to ensure that we on the path to hit this year? To ensure that we on the path to hit five years? To ensure, you know what I'm saying? And ultimately is compounding but it's also like a way i like to give myself checkpoints you know what i'm saying because the older 
the older I become, the more like unattracted I am to goals. It's not about goals, it's about improving my systems to hit my checkpoints. The goals are more like assurance that I'm on the right path. You know what I'm saying? It's like, because ultimately I can't see what is like the maximum version of me maximizing my potential. I don't know exactly what it looks like. Like I have an idea, you know what I'm saying? So the goals only serve as, yeah, I'm on the right path. Was you able to see, cause for me, I remember like, I think I, I had to be some like 15 or something. 16, my whole life I always did that mental uh, imaging of like seeing my higher self, like and having a conversation with him, like, yo, how did you get here? Right? Like my running joke in life is the only person I'm jealous of is my future self. He got everything I want. Mm. Right? So, but for me, like a lot. I look at that like, you know, like this version of myself is, is, is what I was trying to form and see when I was like 15 years old. You know, trying to see yourself 10 years or 20 years from now and like, damn, I wonder what you're going to be doing. And asking the questions like, how the hell did you get that fly? How you get that money? How you get hurt? How you get that influence? How you get that power? And imagining that conversation. So it's like forcing my mind outside of where I currently am to think in a different way. Right. And so now I start to go towards that trajectory. And now I'm at a place where it's like, it's scary imagining where I'm going to go. Because if I'm thinking higher, then I can't... I can't tell everybody else because if I go up from here, oh man, <laughs> that part, you know, <laughs> you know it's like, different. When you were in submission to your journey, yeah, it's like, there's no telling what, what you're going to be. You know, I like to look at it like this, you know, Kanye West, when he was making Through the Wire, it was no way that he saw what he was going to be today. You know what I'm saying? I feel like he's like a perfect example. It's like he was just making Through the Wire. At the time, he was just considered a rapper and a producer. You know what I'm saying? Since then he has broadened his delivery, his expression to the world in so many type of ways, you know what I mean? So it was like, it's vast and it's it's unpredictable. And you know, that's the beauty of potential. Mm -hmm. Like you never know I how love far potential. it could take you. Potential is beautiful, man, because sometimes you can limit yourself. So I don't like, I don't like the word realistic, right? Because I feel like the road to mediocre is paved by realistic expectations. You know what I mean? And, but I do like process. So I don't like when people have goals that they don't have habits for, right? You got a goal to be rich, but you got habits to be poor. That don't make sense. But if I see somebody with a goal and I'm looking at their process on a daily basis, then you show me your trajectory, right? So that's different because you showing me who you becoming, right? Not just what you want. And so a lot of times, you know, a, a people's goals sometimes are connected to their weaknesses and not their strengths. Because you can be inspired by seeing somebody else who has a goal of something that they have done, and that's connected to their strength, right? Like their dream of what they live in, they're good at that. And you want what they have, but you're looking at the outcome of their process of self-development along that journey. So there's a lot of people that's walking around, they might want to be a rapper like Joey Badass. But that may be your weakness. <laughs> right. You know, you might be the person that, that produced the beat. You might be the person that matters your Record artist. Record the video. Record the video. Like, so you have to really, and that goes to the customization of self, like find out who you are first. You understand me? Before you start making all of your goals and things of that nature. Like, understand your programming and the influence of your environment. It can be going against the customization of yourself. Right. I want to double down on that, you know, because something that I always tell groups of kids when I'm speaking to them, I tell my little brother this all the time is, you know, follow your heart, chase your dreams while you're young, especially when you're still living with mom and dad, you know, because you got all the opportunity, you got all the time, you got all the, the, the chances to fail, to form in your face and to, you got a safety blanket, you know what I'm saying? Because when you get out in that real world and you start, you know, trying to chase after your dream and stuff like that is so much more distraction. You know what I'm saying? Now you gotta worry about bills, you gotta worry about surviving, you gotta worry about whatever it is that, you know what I'm saying? You gotta worry about all these different things. So I always try to influence this next generation like, yo, now is the time. You know what I'm saying? Find out who you are now. Don't be afraid to fail. Fail is the formula to success, failure. You know what I'm saying? Because it's never really failure, you just learn. You just learn until you 
find out which formula works, so and, to speak. And, and, and it's an unfortunate thing that I feel like in reality, because you you correct that failure is not looked at the right way, right? A person that, you know, if you're doing a lot of things, you're going to fail at a lot of things, right? If you're doing something great, you may fail greatly, but that's a testament to what you're going for, right? And so in our community, a lot of times, you know, black men and women don't get the grace of failure, right? Where in reality, you're showing me somebody with a lot of ambition, right? If you if you never made a mistake, if you never failed, it's probably because you never tried anything, right? So when I see people going for a lot and they failing a lot, that's not a testament to say that they weak, right? They're growing. And oftentimes we don't let people go through the developmental stages that's necessary in order to be great because we're judging them during their process. Instant gratification. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, Never judge a man's process. His may be different than yours, but that doesn't mean he's not going to get the results that he wants, right? And, and oftentimes, if people are not doing it the way we want them to do it, then we judge them. You feel me? And so I'm one of those people. It's like, and, and many people I grew up with, like, it's, it's many people I know through the streets and throughout life, you know, they made one mistake and that derailed their whole life, right? But it's like, for me, I don't judge a man off his mistakes because I could have did the same thing. Or the mistake that I made when saying, yeah, no, I agree. So I'm able to carry on. I agree, but I do judge a person by their character. Absolutely, you know what I'm saying like a repeated mistake that starts to become character. But that's not, not a mistake. A mistake. <laughs> <laughs> the characteristic, you know what I mean? Yeah, so, no, yeah. you don't. I wish you, don't you get that kind of grace. If you just re if you're repeating the same thing, then that definitely develops into who you are. You know what you do frequently becomes your frequency for sure. But I want to talk about something, man. Um, Christ consciousness. You know, you made a song about Christ consciousness. And for me, like, you know, Christ consciousness is when you crystallize, you know, the mind of God, you know what I mean, unto self, right? And, you know, I'm in my Christ year, like uh, like Nip was, you feel me? And people look at Nip as a, a messianic figure, as many people have seen in messianic figures when you have certain origin stories and you live up to do certain deeds along that story, right? But there's a, a way where, human beings can develop themselves and the way that they live, the way that they move, the way that they spread light and energy, you know, that consciousness becomes crystallized into who you are. Cause we talk about character, right? You can be crystallized into being a devil. You know what I mean? So there's a devil consciousness and there's a Christ consciousness. You know what I mean? You can, you can, you know, walk around as God body and every deed that you do and everybody that you touch, you got that Midas touch. Everything turns into gold. You understand me? But what does Christ consciousness mean to you? I mean, essentially the same thing, you know, is living that a heightened state, an enlightened state of mind. And, um, you know, just really ultimately connected to your higher self and living every day fully in service to what your purpose is or to that what that higher power is. You know what I mean? Where every act is devoted to that. I feel like that's one of the highest levels you can get to in this realm, like as a human being, is to be in a full state of submission to the higher. Mm -hmm. What does the symbols that you have on your ring mean? So this right here is a symbol that I created. So the whole story with this, so first off, I'm a big fan of Prince. You know what I mean? Uh, growing up, I was always a big fan of Prince. Uh, you know, and. Prince had the symbol thing as well. So I was, you know, kind of inspired by him. But one day I had saw this image pop up in my mind's eye. And the first time, you know, I saw this image, it was a similar symbol. Um, well, the first time I saw this image was in my mind's eye, but there was a similar symbol to it that I had saw and it kind of activated my mind's eye. And that's the Luciferian cross of, I think it's like the Church of Satan or something like that. Like I saw it. And I thought it was an interesting symbol because to me, I had saw a J and a B, you know what I mean? But like for me, my perspective and symbols is symbols are neutral. The energy that you put into it is ultimately what, you know, makes it out to be whatever it is. So, you know, this is my own, you know, and the other version of it is like two crosses, or whatever. But That's hard though. The way that I break it down is, is a unison of mind, body, and soul. So the eye represent the third eye of the mind, the cross representing the body, and the infinity representing the spirit, you know? But if, also, if you look closer, you see the J on this side and the B on the yeah. other side. Yeah, that's hard. You know? So I really wanted to create something that could 
represent me. That could also be a call to higher consciousness when people see it like something that just activates in your mind, you know. Also, I was very inspired by my older brother, not my biological, but my man, Capital Steve's, uh, rest in peace. He created a symbol called the 47. And, you know, it was it has similar meaning and intent. It was like a four and a seven, but it kind of looked like a swastika. So it was like it had that same kind of power when people saw it, it like triggered them. You know what I mean? But the intent behind it was to represent balance, to represent truth, to represent harmony between the mind and the heart. You know what I'm saying? So this is kind of my version of like, you know, what Big Bro did. Yeah. yeah. Now that's powerful. To me, symbols, you know, are a lot. I always have my symbols on because symbols can cause an inner knowing and an inner realization. You know what I mean? They embed it within our DNA. You know, we store a lot of information in there and these symbols predate us, right? And so when we see certain symbols, like you said, they evoke that, that energy, that feeling. And so it's like with all symbols throughout the world, you can't tell the symbol no. It goes directly into your subconscious. Higher consciousness meets fashion, meets design, meets a representation of your higher self. How do you actually earn your crown? You gotta have some knowledge yourself. You have to be actively working on the path, consistently doing something great in your life, right? Now, you don't have to be a billionaire. You don't have to be a celebrity. I know I've crowned many people throughout my time. But it's more so about you recognizing who you are and you having something that connects to that in your everyday fashion, in your everyday style. You'll never see me without my crown. Why? Because it represents who I am and I want that to communicate every single time I walk outside. The sun, moon, and stars representing freedom, justice, equality, and enlightenment. Representing truth and a universal mind tapped in to the frequency of higher consciousness and purpose. If you want to represent those same standards at a higher level, and you want to have something that you can adore that represents your rulership in this universe, make sure you tap in and go to Crowns 19 and crown yourself. 19 keys, the designer of crowns, and I want to see you get crowned. Tap in. You know, stories are symbols, right? And that's why it's so powerful when you tell your origin story or you tell a story to the mind. The mind is in a state of agreement, right? It's it's, it, as you listen to a story or a song, is entertainment. A song is a symbol that embeds ideas and feelings and emotions and desires into a person, right? And this is where, you know, we sort of get hypnotized and we go throughout the world. All throughout the world, brands use ancient symbols, right? Whether it's Hermes, right? Or whether, you know, all these symbols come from like ancient African, you know, sources or you know, uh, um, Vodou or Vodom or, you know, this is our alchemy. These are the systems that we've had for a very long time. You understand me? And now we get to see it played out on a large scale basis because they understand the power and we've lost control of understanding that power. Right. And so we are always in this rhythm of overbranding ourselves with everybody else's symbol because we don't have anything connected to ourselves that mean anything. Right. And so I like when I see people create their own symbols because it's like you rewrite your own history. You're taking back your own connection. Facts. Right. And that was my attention on it fully. You know, when I made this, when I seen it in my mind's eye, I saw it on the gates of my estate. I saw it on my bathrobes. I saw it like as a family crest. I saw it like as something that could live beyond the time that my flesh will live. You know what I'm saying? So, but that's how people, you know, and back in the day, everybody created a family crest. You had a family crest. It had a name, it had a meaning, you had a family Bible, essentially, right? Your family name was connected to something, right? On that crest, what is this, a family of honor, a family of trade? So you would build your crest and the symbol of your family in that basis, but now people, family would represent Gucci or something. You feel me? It, it don't have any meaning. You feel me? Like, you can't be like, pop for your symbol, and they could be like, okay, this is what we represent. Here's our crest. Put that on. Go out in there and honor that has been lost. So the art and the way of a lot of things have been lost to, you know, modern man. He don't walk around in a true fashion of representing his consciousness and deliberately creating something in the world. Like, you have to give your children symbols to aspire to because that's going to be embedded in their head. Otherwise, the world will give them symbols, right? Like, 
back in the 1900s when they wanted to get women to smoke, you know, they had to change what the symbol of smoking represented because it was a time where it only represented like, you know, something to men, right? To where it, it was a masculine thing. And then they wanted to get women to do it. So they had to get it, you know, to be seen as a symbol of freedom or rebellion, right? And so the psychologist at that time, you know, what he did was he um, staged during this political protest where all of the women had, you know, they boxes of their cigarettes inside their stocking. And then on cue, they all started smoking. And his goal was to spread this propaganda, you know, that these symbols uh, of cigarettes was a torch of freedom. You understand me? So when they smoke, it was representing their freedom of expression because he said, should we missing half of our consumer base? So his goal was to create emotional connection to products. That's what he did. And that was Edward Barnett, the psychologist. And when he did that, he did that to cigarettes and many other products. And that has been studied and that has been translated throughout time. Right. Symbols are so powerful. And people often think that what they're doing is their own free will. Right. But most men and women are manipulated. Like, and that doesn't stop from the 1900s. That's carried on as a practice throughout eternity. You know, so we live in this time now where you may have a symbol that you think represent, you know, like when we overbrand ourselves or we got all of these new words that go out every single day that, oh, I'm doing this for freedom. I'm doing this for this. You don't even know you may have been manipulated because capitalism need more customers. So they needed to change your behavior pattern so they can make more money, right? And so being cognitive of, symbolic suggestion right is key but most people don't have any subconscious armor you understand me you can be hypnotized and then manipulated and controlled and so it's very important to have a level of you know self-understanding so you know when you're doing something that's not connected to who you truly are ultimately is uh inception absolutely that's what the whole movie was about yeah you know, just yeah planning on ideas into motherfuckers minds that's a fact they, they ain't need to build a machine to just go in your dreams like that's that's the daily practice of reality. You know, that's, that's advertisement, that's right. marketing. Right. So what we're seeing is a lot of agendas right. that are being pushed. And, you know, these symbols are being, you know, we're being force fed these things, these, putting these visuals in our minds. Every generation there exists tools to change the lives of those at the bottom class and at the top. These tools are Things like the internet, or the printing press, or the light bulb. It represents innovation, paradigm shifts for generations to come. Those who have the education are able to take full advantage of the innovation by setting themselves up as the industry leaders, the most qualified and skilled, so they can teach the world what's to come because they are the ones that build it. It's starting to feel like even though we have access to all this information, most people still don't know how, to, don't use know how to use it. It's like the world is getting tested, but you need a cheat code in order to make sure that you pass it. People feel like the algorithm is against us. Well, what if I told you that we built the algorithm that was for you? In the block world order, it's about technology, it's about community, and it's about education. And giving you the opportunity to free yourself to make sure that you're not waiting on the next generation and the next tool and the next technology and the next update to be free. If you come on this journey and this ride with us, we'll make sure that you grow with us, you build with us in a manner to where you won't be left behind. Won't be left behind. There's perfection, and then there's greatness. Perfection is the state you reach, but it can never be consistent because the moment that you move is no longer in that same perfect state. Your goal is to reach greatness, but I want greatness to be normalized. I don't want it to be something that only this 1% have access to. This new 1% that runs parallel to it are those who understand how to innately tap into their gifts. See, I look at the way that the world has been created and the way that the world is consistently being ran. When you have monarchies, Monarchy they can just tell you that their bloodline is more world than everybody else. Majesty. They create rules, Wait, they create listen. seals, they put it on paper, and the rest of the world starts to follow that forever. Now that's power. It's not perfect, but it's great. But it's great. Now we got new systems, blockchain. These systems sit there to challenge the existing system, where new seals, new families, new records, new history can be created. But what does that matter if you're not educated and you're consistently distracted? They said because of social media, this new technology, it has actually made people 
more distracted and less focused. So therefore, they say the average person can only focus somewhere around seven to 10 seconds. Seven to 10 seconds. <laughs> now for me, I think that's terrible. The reason I think it's terrible because we have access to more information than any other people at any other point in time, yet we don't know what's right, what's wrong, what's good, what's bad, what's value, and what's bull. So it's not about just having information, it's about the curation of information. Who's bringing it to you? Who can cipher it? What type of community and environment that you are in? Because growth comes from the three E's, education, exposure, and experience. See, if you can curate your education, then you can make sure that you're not just getting new knowledge, you're getting valuable knowledge that's actually applicable to your freedom and your power. You understand me? Now, the exposure is your environment because everything that you observe, you see, you feel, you hear, you become the embodiment, you vibrate at that rate. So if you're not surrounded by wealth, how can you ever vibrate, magnify, magnetize, and attract it to your reality? I was talking to my brother Idris Sandu the other day, and we were talking about the difference between manifestors and alchemists. See, some people, they can drop a thought, draw it into their universe, and build wealth and attract the right things to them. And other people, they work with what they have to be able to produce it, regardless of where they are. See, some people, you have to understand whether you're a generator or you're a manifester and understanding your human design and your blueprint. Therefore, it gives you the right mindset. So when I say 80% mindset, 20% skill set, I mean that. But see, if you don't have the right mindset, you can't develop the right skill set. Most of you, I took courses in education and financial literacy, but when you look in your environment, you don't feel no financial liberation. We want to liberate you by helping you change the way that you think and giving you access to new education, technology, and tools that can help you enhance and give you an edge in the marketplace. You go try to try a test today in school or you can get out of high school and they tell you to take this test, you won't feel so confident. Whether it's social studies, mathematics, geography, no matter what it is. But if they tell you we'll give you the cheat codes, everybody feel like they go pass it. And see, back in the day, teaching each other and giving each other the answers, they said it was cheating, they said it was wrong. But I'm here to tell you it's no longer wrong. I want to teach you how to cheat. The reason we want to teach you how to cheat because we want to give you the codes. We want to give you the answers because they've been hidden from you for so long that you deserve them. You deserve to have your mind right, your spirit right, your finances right. You understand me? You deserve a better life. But that can only come with better decisions, better investments, and better opportunities. In the block world order, this is what we stand for. The right community, the right education, the right technology. Through this test of life, we'll give you the cheat codes to make sure that you pass. Tap in. So let me ask you, Capital Steve's, man. Yeah. You know, rest in peace to the good brother. Um, he seemed to be a visionary. Absolutely. You know, what do you think his vision would be today? Or did he have a vision or set up like outline? You feel yeah, me? As I mean, far as where he wanted things to go. His vision was definitely wanting everyone to, of course, realize their power, unlock their potential. But, you know, when it came to the the arena of spirituality. So, you know, something that he was big on was the 13 chakra system and opening all your chakras and, you know, ultimately bringing you into an elevated state of consciousness where, you know, you can start to wake up from the ills of the world or the spells of the world. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's what he wanted more than anything, especially for our generation, was everybody to wake up and realize, you know, what's what's really going down, you know what I'm saying, what this matrix is that we're in and, you know, these things that are being implanted in our minds and how none of these ideas are original, you know what I'm saying, and it's a call to action to have our own original ideas and call to higher consciousness, ultimately, you know. And um, it's, it's interesting, man, because a lot of what I see today is, you know, what, he, what we was on, what he was on you know, 10 years ago, 11 years ago. Um, I wish he could have seen the world today. You know what I'm saying? Like the fact that me and you were sitting here yeah. having this conversation. It sounds like he and did And it's going to go it. platinum on YouTube. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, but you know what I mean though? Like I wish no, he was No, but I'm just active. saying like, like that idea of like, the thing about being a visionary, man, is 
you see it before you experience it. No, nah, for but sure. But by seeing it, you experience it. For sure. Man, and that's that's the beautiful thing about reflecting upon people who, you know, seemingly go before their time is that they when, when you grant it that mind's eye, you did see it. Yeah. You know, like it's you like, yo, listen, everything. man, his, his, his vision was so profound that from his vision, we were able to influence a whole generation. You know what I'm saying? Like my generation, I want to say that we were largely responsible for a lot of these kids learning about the path of enlightenment, learning about the chakra system, wearing crystals around their necks. You know what I'm saying? And I couldn't be more proud to call him my big brother. And, you know, it's, it's an interesting story with me and Steve, too, because my whole life, you know, I told you I was the only child. I spent a lot of alone time. You know, I wasn't in the streets, but I was in the streets. You feel me? Like, I was a street kid. I knew what was going on. My family, cousins, everybody was involved in what was going on, but... Somehow I had a steady head on my shoulders where I knew I wanted to be my own thing. I wanted to have my own original idea, my own control over my life. You know, I felt like everything else that I was seeing, I could have easily succumbed to, and that would have been the easy thing for me to do. So that's why I always never followed anyone. But when I met him, he was the first person, like, you know, outside of obviously, you know, family or something like that, where I felt like, yo, I could trust this dude. I could follow you know what I mean? I could follow him and he won't lead me wrong. You know what I'm saying? And I am ultimately a product of that. You That's know what I mean? Of what he was. It reminded me of Nipsey also because, you know, my brothers, they just did the uh, the interview with Black Sam and Kabi and the team. And it's a common thread of when you able to take some knowledge that you learn and impart it upon the people so very well. You know what I mean? Like they get it and understand it to their pace, right? But it's left a mark in them embedded to where you can never die because everywhere you see them, my presence is there. So when I'm sitting there, I'm listening to Black Sam and I only met Nipsey through passing very fast, but talking to Black Sam and being in their presence, it was exactly like what I imagined, right? Nipsey also was. Right, because not only you see as an older brother the commonality and what he passed on to Nipsey, you see what Nipsey passed on to him, right? And it's right there in existence. So it's like, damn, breath spirit is completely right there, still ignited. And that's in all of his team members, and there's a blueprint in that. You know what I mean? When you really become, you know, uh, uh, the root and the symbol for your team and your family, you can truly instill that into everybody around you and they can take that and they can give it to everybody around them, right? And now you are creating leaders because the ability, you know, the, the idea of follow a leader is, you know, it's the same. Every leader has to follow something so that he can lead. You understand me? And every follower is learning how to be a good leader by following. And so the greater you are at following, the greater you can be at leading. leading. And so it's this cyclical process so hearing that, man, that's, that's powerful because it just reminds me of, you know, a thought that I've been having as, you know, I work to inspire my own family and inspire the world, you know what I mean, in the right direction because, you know, being a man in the midst of all of the agendas and things of the nature that exist, it ain't easy. You know, it's a daily battle. And one thing I try to do, two things, is I try not to relate to bullshit and I try to never be impressed by anything. You know what I mean? Except God, right? So as I move through the world, my way of staying balanced is nothing impresses me because the moment something impresses you, it can change you. It changes the integrity of who you are. Now you are inspired by something. You see something, now it can control you. Are you impressed by this? You want this? Yeah, keep doing this to get this. Now a person can control you with those things you're impressed by. I walk through, I'm impressed by myself. I am me. I'm not going to be impressed and say there's something outside myself that's greater. You know what I'm saying? I'm impressed by God. He already made me. He did the greatest thing he could possibly do. And relating to things is like, you know, everybody with a mouthpiece, you know, and some trauma can start a podcast. But people out here relating to things, when you relate to something, you create a relationship to it. Right. Right. And so this person could have just got out of a relationship. Here they starting a podcast and they talking about the opposite gender. And of course they go do it from a traumatic standpoint. And you sitting there 
self-cycling your trauma saying, I relate to that. Now you're creating a relationship to it. You're creating a connection to it. That's not good. So I try, you know, as I listen to things, I make sure I don't want to relate to it. I want to make sure I hear, like, I cannot relate to Brett Prop. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, even, even if you may have went through it, but to relate to it is saying, I'm creating a relationship to it. I'm validating this relationship. So it's, it's purposely detaching so that, you know, you can practice strategy and true mindfulness of thinking. You know what I mean? The way of thinking is very powerful. You dig? So that's one of my, my arts of like the way of my mind and the way of living is try not to relate to too many things and try not to be impressed by anything. Yeah, that's interesting. When it comes to though spiritual and mental health, you know, because I deal with this a lot in my family. I deal with this in the world. I just came from Jamaica and man, the energy yeah, I saw you was, was vibrational. Yeah. I ain't want leads. It was here. <laughs> Where'd you, you go? Was this time I went to uh Montego Bay. Last time okay. I was in um just a little farm island, man. I stayed there for a month. So this time it was more of like a, just a recharge, some tourist type activities. But last time I was really out there in Jamaica. You know what I'm saying? I visited the Bobo Shanti tribe. I went up there to um, see the Maroons, you know what I'm saying? To Blue Mountain Cafe. Like I was I was out there, you feel me? Um, but that was at a time I wasn't as popular as I am right now, so I can just travel by myself. <laughs> you know, I, got, I move a little different now, but Jamaica is a very powerful place. And what I was getting to is just the necessity to recharge. Right. Sometimes I get to a point where I don't believe in the law of balance in the sense where, you know, people always tell me I need to have balance. You need to have abundance and able to do this job. Right. If you got balance, you can teeter on the path between negative and positive. Right. And one thing can knock you off and it can put you in a state of anxiety because I've experienced anxiety lately and that ain't me at all. So it let me know I'm not doing I'm not living accordingly to my way. Right, because I, I can go a long time and go through a lot of different things and no anxiety exists. Right, because, you know, anxiety is ultimately a sign of, well, in this case, I would say it's a sign of being burnt out. You know, that's how I feel when I know I'm just working myself to the ground. You know, last year I learned a valuable lesson because for so long I've been the person who it's hard for me to relax. It's hard for me to, you know, take that time and just go on vacation. And even if I do, it's hard for me to go for longer than four or five days. Right, and be <laughs> present too. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because I'm like, I'm so eager to work. I'm such a workaholic. I want to put numbers on the board. I right. want to make progress. I right. want to see myself progressing every day. Right. You know, but last year I definitely learned the importance of having that time to revitalize, to recharge. You know what I'm saying? Because if we not functioning at our highest level, Ain't no way that we could produce high level. That's a fact. Content or product, fact. you know what I'm saying? So you got to take that time to go sit in the sun or to just go, you know, have that stillness and so you can return with that 100%, that 110% energy that you need. That for me was like, you know, waking up with the sun, going to sleep with the sun, living like a plant. You feel me? And, and it reset my whole cycle. And I just felt like, damn, I feel like myself again. And I forgot, like, this is how I normally supposed to feel. Like, I, I'm 100% charged, and it's like a phone where you never let it get to 100%. So the speed is never yeah. going to be. And we you put it on so the charge used. real quick, and we yeah. always leave in the crib with the phone on, like, 35%, 45%. <laughs> yeah. You know, go dead out by the end of the day, you know what I mean? Just on these little uh, juice moments and not, like, you know what I'm saying, the full recharge. Leave it on there the whole day is just... Charged, you know and what I'm that, saying? And that's what I mean by abundance. Abundance is being a hundred percent. The most people that balance, I just charge it to forty percent, fifty percent. No, charge it to a hundred. And don't let it get down until it dies again. You know what I mean? That's that's not the way. You feel me? So for me, like that gave me such a recharge and, and yeah, I was like, you I when I found myself being ready to go back home, that's when I knew I had a problem. Like, I'm sitting in this beautiful tropical zone. And you want to go back home. Yeah, I want to go back home so I can work and do something. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, well, I'm yeah. tripping. I don't like, really want to be back home. People like us, too, you know, we got to, we can never forget it from an energetic standpoint. Our output to the world is so high. You know what I'm saying? We sit here and we have a conversation that's going to be consumed by millions of people out there. It's like, energetically, we putting out so much. So from something like this, you know, that's like having five, this is like having six apps open right. on the phone, you know what I'm saying? It's draining the battery while playing music in the background. 
while on FaceTime with somebody. <laughs> You know what I'm I, I, I try to cut them apps off these days, but it, I have a hard for sure. time. For sure, you know what I'm we, like, we all do. My brother met you smiling because he not watch them, them tabs be open. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But when, when I find decreased mental acuity, that's when it's like, all right, this get bad. Because I don't. When I hear people talking about anxiety, and anxiety is very real, and mental health within, you know, our structure and society is very, very, very real, and it's not something we address enough because sometimes we we'll let our battery die before we plug it up again. And so it's like, nah, address that when it's at 50%. You feel me? That's the form of self-care, right? And so it's like, even when I work out and as I was studying it, you know, I said, you going to sleep at 10 o'clock and allowing that hormone growth to happen between 10 and 12 for those two hours, that's more efficient than me being awoke, thinking, uh, uh, awake, thinking uh, I'm doing something. Like rest is part of the process. And learning to sit still to be more efficient is the key. You know what I'm saying? Because you can kill yourself. You feel me? Um, in a sense where once you drained, it's very hard to get back to your normal self because you can change the structure of something once it goes all the way out and then you got to charge it back up, then try to get it back. But each time the phone is spending way more energy or the mind or the body. So that maintenance. And then you start catching viruses. Right. <laughs> hey, hey, you yeah, know? yeah, you're out there doing too much plugging in. <laughs> you feel me? So, you know, you got to be careful with all that. Yeah. But I want to talk more on just that subject of, you know, because for me, nature does it. You know, like you said, you got a green thumb, so you surround yourself by some nature and some greenery. That hue, you know, is important. But for me, I know. The moment I go back in nature, the moment I go plug my toes into some sand, I went diving, I went to the Blue Lagoon, I was doing all kind of stuff, and that just brought me back. You feel me? But for me, nature is God therapy room. You don't need to do nothing else. Just go into nature. Just shut up, and I promise you, that's plugging yourself into the earth. You know what I'm saying? So, like, what's your rituals, though? Like, as a man, you present yourself as a man at all times. And that re in this world, it requires you to be charged up at all times. You know what I mean? It's like your screen never going off when you always a man. You know what I'm saying? That means your battery's always cycling. So that means you have to find a way to stay charged before it gets too late. So, you know, what's, what's Joey Badass' way of, you know, this is where I charge myself, where I'm in my grace of vulnerability. Well, you know, like we spoke about a little bit earlier, uh, you know, when I wake up, I like to take time for myself. There's different ways I do that. Uh, you know, normally it starts with a prayer and a meditation. You uh -huh. know, just being in a state of gratitude, you know what I mean? Acknowledging that there's another day, acknowledging that there's so much abundance around, acknowledging that there's so much power and there's so much potential to unlock. Giving myself a moment of stillness, doing some stretches, you know what I mean? I might even do, I like to do a 50 clip every morning too, you know what I'm saying? Just getting my blood flowing. And then from there, it's like, okay, cool. What's the first external thing that needs to be addressed? You know what I mean? But my whole morning pretty much is dedicated to myself. You know what I mean? It's like from there, I get some food, you know, and I go to the gym. You know, if, if I ain't got to drop my daughter off. And then the gym is like a, my mental, spiritual dojo as well. Because I'm in there and I'm locked in and you know, I'm I'm in that growth mindset because I'm seeing progress in real time, you know? And then from there, it's like even my commute to the gym is part of my whole spiritual uh, 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 a daily process, you know what I'm saying? Because it's like 45 minutes for me to get there. So sometimes I watch I watch your part, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, sometimes I might I might throw in a, a, a high level episode yes, sir. or something like that. Something to just put into my mind. Which does increase muscle growth. <laughs> like a steroid <laughs> that's funny but you know um you know putting different things into my mind that i deem as you know what my mind needs at the time and um you know then from there i'm able once i get back home i'm able to attack my day like whatever it is as far as on a professional level you know what i'm saying but just to me taking that time for self is so important because that's that's just ways you could charge real quick. You know what I'm saying? It's like when you just wake up and you get to like like say you say you wake up late and you gotta just hurry out the door. Like that's so much stress and anxiety you put upon yourself. You ain't give yourself a chance to really approach the day with grace. You know what I'm saying? So that's key for me. No, no, I feel that. I mean, 
you know, it's a it's an ongoing struggle of balancing or creating a system and adhering to it. You know what I mean? Because you want to skip steps. I don't you, when you feel I don't need to do that, especially when you get to a point where you feel like, all right, I'm charged up. I can go back to my old ways. And so for me, that's that's really the daily battle. You know what I mean? So like going through the process of going to the gym daily has helped me out tremendously, right? You know. My goal was to get on my Adonis Creed, on my Dame. Now it's to be on my Goku. You understand me? So that's my body goals right now. So I'll probably be there in about two months. You know what I'm saying? By the time I'm on tour. But on my daily, I gotta hit the I gotta I gotta make sure my shoulders is crazy. But I don't have goals though. It's a process. So as I'm studying it, yeah, I'm studying now, cause for me it's like become what you wanna be, right? So it's like, all right, what do you if if I say I want to see myself have growth in the gym. And what I'm saying is I'm about to become a power lifter or a bodybuilder. You know what I mean? Do it, taking their process. Cause I know for a fact, if I copy their process, that's what I become. Right. You feel me? Now for you though, you took on the process of acting and you do it very well. Right. So what gets you to the rhythm of like, what, what you know, like, is there somebody you follow? Cause one day I want to get on my Denzel keys. You feel me? <laughs> very soon. <laughs> There's no keys. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, it's, it's definitely been a dream for a minute. Uh, and especially because I don't see my representation on the screen nowhere. You feel me? Like, I want my character in the world in the algorithm. I like Wu-Tang because I feel like it really shows, like, the development of a young black man with also going through the streets and consciousness. Right. right. And I feel like they're doing a very great job of, like, showing that coming-of-age tale. Right? But, like, what got you through the preparation and the confidence of like, yo, I'm about to kill this? Um, well, you know, acting is always something that I saw myself doing, something that I wanted to do since I was a kid. Um, you know, in middle school, I mean, music was always my first love. You know, let's start there. Music was always my first love from from the moment I saw Biggie, from the moment I saw that hypnotized video, the juicy video, whatever it was. It was something about the art form of music that resonated deep inside with me where I was inspired to also use my words in similar ways, you know what I mean? But uh, growing up, you know, there were different people who were instrumental and, you know, just huge inspirations to me. Somebody like Tupac, for example. You know, he was an incredible artist, but also, you know, he had time on the screen. Will Smith, somebody else, you know, who started out as an artist and, you know, had incredible time on the screen. So, you know, these characters were always inspirations to me growing up, and they always served as, you know, just the fact that I could do it as well. You know what I'm saying? I could I could do both if I wanted to. If I, if I was into both, I, I could have both. So when I got to high school was when, you know, I decided, you know, growing up in Brooklyn, I always knew I, I always knew I wanted to make music, I wanted to be a rapper or sing or whatever it was through hip hop. But going to high school, you know, the knowledge became started to become more specialized. You know what I'm saying? Like high school was like a preparation for college. It's like, okay, so what do you want to begin studying? And, you know, I realized that there was no programs that I could sign up for, apply to that would help me with my music endeavors uh -huh. that I had. So the next best thing for me was um, acting, which got me into theater. So for high school, you know, I got into performing arts high school in the theater program, and you know, I was in there for like a year or two. I gained my information. Ultimately, I got kicked out the program because, you know, my mind st still wasn't there <laughs> yet. He was wilding. <laughs> not, not that I was wilding, but I came from public school, yeah. and, and this was still a public school. But I came from, you know, zone schools, <laughs> all black schools. And then now here I was, this first time going to school with white kids who've been doing this their whole life. Mm -hmm. Who've been doing this since they were, you know yeah. what I'm saying, in elementary school. And you know, ultimately, I didn't want to compete. <laughs> I, I didn't want to compete with yeah. them. Like, I saw what it was, I gained what I needed from that, and I just kind of started to lose interest because, you know, music was still a thing I was doing. I had met all my boys from my crew, like in high school, and we had assembled and we had already started charging on that path. And I always looked at it like, what I learned about the, the the film industry right away, just from high school, was that trying to make it as an actor in New York would be really difficult. You know what I'm saying? It's like finding a needle in a haystack. So I thought, you know what? I already got this music thing going. I'm going to double back. 
I'm a I'm a do what I got to do here. I'm a focus on on this egg in this basket, and I'm gonna come back later with leverage. Mm. So it's always just been right there that you wanted to do, like parallel to your dreams of doing music. Exactly. You know what I mean. But also, I understood that I had higher chances and higher skill at the time to pursue music. So I had to prioritize that because, you know, I feel we have a lot of people out there now who are like multi-talented and, you know, they have a hard time figuring out what path to choose ultimately, what, what, what path to, to prioritize and focus on, you know what I'm saying? So for me, it was a matter of reading the room, right? I'm like, okay, both worlds are pretty, di both industries are pretty difficult to get into, but I got more power and resources here. So let me focus on this. And ultimately I'll be able to use my leverage from this to get into that thing. That's key. And that's exactly what I did. You know what I'm saying? That's exactly the way I visualized it. And that's exactly the way it happened. My first gig that I got was in the show called Mr. Robot. Um, shout out to Sam Esmail because he wanted me in the show from season one, unbeknownst to me, you know, so season two, I guess he finally got a contact for me and I came in and I did the audition. And I remember doing the audition and him laughing hysterically. And like, you know, I was super young. I'm like, what the fuck is this dude laughing at? You know what I'm saying? And you know, later on he revealed to me that he was laughing so funny because he thought that he was such a genius because he had envisioned me playing this role. And when I came to audition, it was so perfect. That he like, you know what I'm saying? It was like just a moment of like, I fucking knew it. You know what I mean? But shout out to him because he actually saw me. You right. know what I'm saying? It's like I had the thought in my mind and I was holding it here. And you know, the universe knew that. So it was almost like it connected with him and he was the guy that like, you know, kind of give me my first break into it. And it's like, you know, my first day showing up on a film and TV set was alongside Rami Malik and Krishna Slater. I'm like, that's. You know what I mean? Like, so uh, immediately I had to adjust to the status quo of greatness. <laughs> it was no other way. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, here I am at this scene with these greats. I have no other choice but to be great, but to meet this level. And That's from dope. there, that was my level. That's dope. You know? Because even when I watch, you know, the character Unique, the anti-hero, you know what I'm saying? Because... And anti-heroes, I, I, I think, you know, there's, there's good and bad with it because you get to show the nuance of, you know what I mean, black characters, you know what I mean, specifically. Like, you know, we're not a monolith. Like, those people sometimes who may do bad, they got a real human side to them as well. And so being able to show the complexity of a character, I think, is key. And it, it can uh, humanize a character, being an anti-hero character, because they oftentimes have more depth and complexity to them. And I think that's why, you know, people gravitate towards the anti-hero in the show because they're more relatable than the hero, if you will, right? The hero always acts like they don't want the job, they don't want the powers, they don't want the position, but the anti-hero, you know, get to have real struggle and real ideology and real philosophy of why they're doing it and get to have real things going on in life that's human challenges, you feel me, that I think are key. But that role to me is seeing you playing, it was like, you know, I, I don't know where Unique started and Joey Badass ended. Mm. You know what I mean? <laughs> and I think that's when you play a role really good, where it's like, damn, which part is the character and which part is you? You feel me? Because when you adapt that rhythm and you win it, it's like, oh, that was that was smooth. Like, you took over the screen when you came in. Right. You feel me? And then that allows, and, and, and then also in the movie, Two Distant Strangers, because I watched that one and that was powerful and I feel like that showed as well a completely different side of, you know, especially the amount of takes it has to go through the same scene and do it differently, right? And then show the range of emotion of being in awe and trying to figure it out. And that was powerful. For me, that was like, oh, bro, I could actually like act. You know, when you see a rapper about to act, you like, all right, they, they gave him the role. Yeah, yeah, but like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I don't know if this is going to be good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was actually good. And I liked the concept because I used to love the movie Groundhog Day. So, you know, it really brought it back with something that in, in those type of movies, you always imagine what would I do in that scenario? You feel me? And so I thought that was dope. But the unique character was like, yo, that really shows, you know, I feel like bringing the music, bringing the culture, bringing Flatbush, bringing your experience in hip hop, the stories that you've seen. It's like it allows you to play, 
and use everything that you've been through in life and play this character yeah, out you, freely. You're absolutely right, you know, and unique is the role that I always knew that once I got, it was gonna be over, you know, and I held out on that role for a long time because that's why I was grateful when Mr. Robot came through because, you know, I wanted to show people that I could act. I always knew I could do it. You know what I'm saying? It's unique lives inside of me. You know what I'm saying? I always knew I could bring that character to life, but I didn't want to get marginalized and, like, you know, put into that stereotype role as an actor. I wanted people to see my range. You know what I mean? So at the time that Unique came through, it was right on time. It was it was divine. And, you know, I had already shot Two Distant Strangers, so I was like, it's perfect. You know what I mean? This is literally the duality, like you said. You know what I mean? So, well, how's it working with... You know, just the whole power crew, because I feel like the power universe is dope. And I like what Ryan Coogler are doing. I like what um, they're doing with Creed, uh, Michael B. Jordan. Because I feel like we at this point, sometimes people act like it's normal. Like what he just did with Creed, I think was amazing. You know what I mean? I loved it. I ain't seen no weird stuff in the movie, and it was just a straight good film. And it wasn't even about two black men going at each other. You know what I mean? It was about brotherhood and redemption. And I think that that was a great plot and twist that he put on the movie, you know, and he took what was Rocky and continued it and made it a different series, but one that's even more relatable. You know what I mean? And, and it's on his third film right now, and that ain't really never been done, right? And so, you know, I'm gonna do the bragging for him because I love when we showcase our genius because I know how hard that has to be to take a franchise, direct in it, star in it, utilize your resources, come together, and then make something that's magical on screen and kill it in the marketing as well. You feel me? So, you know, first of all, I just want to give a high-level observation to that one. You feel me? Because we do a lot of great things, and I just don't feel like yeah, shout we're out to truly B. appreciated. And then I want to know for you, what's the dream role? Like, for me, I, I got to – it got to be something different, but, like, what's, what's Joey Badass Storm? He, this is your movie or your show. You feel me? What's the movie? I'm so glad you asked me that question because, you know, this is something that I've been holding in my mind for a long time. So it was like a role that I would love to play that I would say is probably like my number one dream role. Because it's like three. It's like three roles. Um, it's, it's, it's really no order. I want to do all of them, and I, I will. But one of them is I want to play a very revolutionary character. Like almost like Judah and the Black Messiah. What Daniel did in that, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Like I, I was sick that I didn't get to audition for that, that movie. Was I was sick, but yeah. you know, uh, Godspeed, you know what I mean? But that's that's the type of character I would love to play, like, uh, you know, Shane Guevara or something like that, you know. Uh, just, just, just one of those com complicated, nuanced, revolutionary figures, you know what I'm saying? I would love to bring that, something like that to life. Another character I'd love to play, speaking of Creed, is, is a boxer. You know what I mean? I would love to do some type of biopic or, you know, some type of oh, shit. Yo, Mike, Creed 4, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. let's do it. You know what I mean? Like, I would love to do a boxing movie. And finally, uh, this is more just like a genre or a space that I'd like to see brought forth more in the film industry. And it's, it's like black magical realism. Mm. So, you, you know, know take Jordan Peele or take Black Mirror and take something historic like uh, what my man James Samuels is about to come out with, the uh, the Book of Clarence joint that he got, you know, meshing that all together and telling our history in a different type of way, in a way that hasn't been seen yet. You know what I mean? Like we always, for example, right, and I can get this one away because this is whatever I think this is be manifested on its own. But it's like we always talk about you know, black people as kings and queens, but why haven't we seen that visually? Yet? Right. Why haven't we seen that? A you know, Hannibal like, Barker like, movie. Like Michael, Michael Jackson, Remember the Time video. Right. Like, why is there not a movie of that? Right. A, a whole TV series right. of that. Like, that's what I'm trying to see. And we got so you know, many like, stories. I want to see films that represent the voodoo story. I'm hella butchering the name. What's what's my good brother name? Uh, the Haitian Renaissance? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Toussaint? Yeah, Toussaint. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? That'd be a dope one. It's just that when he really started making movies, he was like 50. 
Yeah, he was like, oh, get the prosthetics and I'll be the younger bird. That show is coming of age and development. You know what I mean? As a young warrior, why he got to think like a general. That's the first one that I thought about. I was like, I would love to play him, but when I actually did the research, I'm like, damn, he was just much older. It could be another soldier in the movie that gets a spotlight. No, for sure. Tucson, you feel me? But like, no, movies like that for me, like Hannibal Barker is a movie I would love to play in. You know what I mean? Hannibal Barker, he was a 20 some year old general, but he conquered Rome. You know what I mean? Mm. Like, that's the father of military genius. They use his script. Right. You know what I mean? He, 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 he went in there, rolled in on them African elephants. You feel me? And, you know, when you get to imagine stories like that or like John Horse, who fought in the Seminole Wars, who fought, you know, for America, against America, fought for his freedom multiple times, like, you reimagine what it is to be a, a brown, melanated, copper man in the world. That's a fact. You show the real magic we go, of these brothers. We introduce the new images. Yeah. Right? You know what I mean? Like, that's that's what I'm on. That's what I'd like to bring to the film industry. You know what I'm saying? That's what I see in my future right there is bringing these new images of our culture to the mainstream. You know what I'm saying? Like, I want, I want our, these new generation of babies to have the visual, not just the knowledge, but also have the visual that will ultimately you know, push their minds even further, you know what I'm saying? Because most of the stuff that I study in history, when I find out about them, you know, I'm like, damn, this brother existed. He had did all of this, and it changes your, your narrative on who you are because now that becomes, like, your basis. Like, some people's story is plugged into, oh, we started from slavery. Nah, it's crazy. But when you like, yo, it was a, a young black man that his father fought, he continued the war of his father and won? and it was the only one who won, that's different. But when you put that on screen, we have more tales about us being heroes than we have of our failures. Right now we have more of our failures. We don't have our hero tales. So when you do that, you manufacture and you program the mind, right? So now you believe it's possible because there's so many people in the hood where their mind limits, it lacks exposure. So they can't think expansive because they ain't seen it. They don't know it's possible. Now, you know, they got, you know, the, the what's possible in the hip hop world or maybe a Robert Smith or Don Peoples. There's a few examples, but like screens, that's, that's symbols coming to life, constantly feeding you emotions and ideas. Like, yo, you brave, you great. Like what they did with Woman King. Right. Right. Back to what we was talking about earlier yeah. with like, you know, celebrities or these images having more control and power over children and their parents. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? This all plays into that, you know? So that's what I'm trying to be a part of. Let's push for that new imaging, those hero stories for us. You know what I'm saying? It's like, I want to show, I also want to show like, I want black people to not be afraid of their power. I, I want them to not be afraid of their mysticism. You know what I'm saying? Because they uh, they they stole that from us, and they made us afraid of our own selves, of what we're actually capable of. And, you know, like you talked about voodoo. Voodoo is it, it involves a lot of multi um, sensory rituals, just like hip hop, right? And when you think about that, like hip hop is the song, there's dance, we smoke, we drink, and voodoo is the same thing, right? There's chants, there's rhythm, and you know, spicy foods, right? Everything about black people is a is a ritual. Right? Like, we don't even realize we're constantly stimulating all of these senses and practicing multi sensory rituals, right? The club is a multi sensory ritual to put us in entranced states. But when we actually understood it and used it, then we used it for a power to destroy our enemy, right? And conquer ourselves. And, you know, whether it was, you know, and, and most people probably couldn't understand the difference, and they can do it the difference between the voodoo, the voodoo, and the voodoo and just understanding those different origins. But when you go over to Africa and you see the practices and the power that the people are able to conjure up, and when you can focus that, and that's the key, because when you get somebody like Tucson or Nanny and the Maroons, you know, they won their wars, right? Focus in that power, you know what I mean? And that's something that we lacked. But if we're retaught and we can revisit those rituals, we can understand why hip hop is so powerful. Because hip-hop is part of, like, a voodoo practice. Absolutely. You know, I feel like hip-hop, we need some type of, like, high-level committee. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh... Who on your drink committee then, man? Who up there? I don't know if I care to say. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I just... 
for, for me, it's, it's more about the intention. I just feel like there there are people, you know, out there in the world, real role players out there in the hip hop community who would have enough influence to, you know, create a type of space like this for a bunch of rappers or, you know, just people in the industry, thought leaders, speakers to come together and for us to have some type of just collective thought direction of, where, of, of, of how we want the culture to be viewed and how we want it to be preserved and, you know what I'm saying, where we see it going. I just feel like it's time for that. A hundred percent. You know, that's, for me, if like in, in real life, that's really part of my mission, like as a whole. That's why I call myself a thought leader. It's teaching this direction of thinking. You know right. what I mean? Leading us in the right way. Like, what's going on here? Well, let me tell Pushing you how to Pushing these plans to the sun, man. Yeah. But when we look at it right now, you know, like um, recently it's the story of BT, right? I'm trying to see if it's going to be a committee of black billionaires that buy it. But the overarching narrative is that, you know, the black billionaires don't work with each other. You know what I'm saying? They never unite for anything, right? So the play would be, okay, this is finally an opportunity to where we get over what's the current narrative and we finally show the world, like, all right, we can work together for a play. And something like media, like what we're talking about, BT, is still a staple. It created the first black billionaire in America. Media is very powerful. Entertainment is very powerful. So with that being black owned again, right, I think it's key because then you get to see ideas of like what we talking about in reality. And I don't think just one person needs to own it. You know what I mean? I like it when it's a shared venture. So therefore, if Diddy and Tyler Perry and Jay-Z and, you know, these other billionaires is out there or or, or funds own it, now the resources are more vast, right? And the interests are more diverse at the table. You know what I'm saying? And so when it comes to young generational leaders such as yourself or myself that have these ideas that are creatives, that are showing the world like, I got a hit show. We got 25 million views already. You know what I'm saying? But there's no black media house that could even pick it up in the sense of like, yo, man, we want to give you 50 million. Like, let's blow this up even more. We have to create those houses. So even when we do great organic and original things, we have somewhere we can take it to the next level. Absolutely. You know what I mean? And then when it comes to hip hop, I think it's, 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 you got, you know, old men for council, young men for war. And what you're talking about is a war, right? Because anytime you go against the grain, it's a war, it's a battle, it's a fight. And so you have the scale of people who are comfortable in their capitalism, and that's that's them. But if they can conjure up some sense of revolutionary and saying, well, listen, here's the plan. I know you remember when you had ideas like this, but I'm actually in that space where I'm committed to it. You know what I mean? All I need you to do is open the doors. You feel me? And so for them, I feel like the idea is more so fund the young generals, fund the young leaders, or at least open up the doors that allow them to get to where they want to be if you don't want to be in that forefront. You know what I mean? And so strategy is, you know, is when you try to create a strategy for something, you got to figure out what is our options because we can talk about it, but, you know, you're a person that lives it. I'm a person that lives it, you know what I mean, in execution. And it's going to take time, and I'm patient as well because, you know, patient is the only way to cure it you know, the distance of where we trying to go. You know what I mean? If I'm patient, we already there because I'm not tripping off the destination. I'm in the process. So with hip hop, with media, right, I think we've shown our collective magic. We influence the whole world, right? And we have Please. It's the biggest genre and the most influential in the world for a reason because we're the most magical people to exist. But now, conjure that and focus it. You know what I mean? Stop letting everybody else control it. You know what I mean? Like, stop letting all our stories be funded, controlled, and owned by white corporations. Why don't we have the power to put out our stories? Why is it somebody else taking, you know, a risk? Oh, I took a risk and I pitched Woman King and we did it. Why couldn't that be a black woman or a black man? Like, we don't make real progress until we control our progress. We can't have somebody else controlling it and then they get awarded for doing something risky and then we call it progress. No, progress is when we control our fate. You feel me? And that's what I'm for 100%. But it's going to take some real human beings, you know, to be fearless and be confident and live that life. Yeah, it's like, you know, I look around today and there's a lot of representations for us I feel like no longer exists. For example, we no longer got the Source Award. 
You know what I'm saying? Like, there used to be so much more different award shows and, like, you know, different platforms where we honored ourselves and we celebrated our, ourselves, and a lot of those are not non-existent today. Even when you're looking at the film and TV industry, like, ain't no Martin, ain't no Fresh Prince of Bel-Air no more, ain't no, um, ain't no Friday of this generation, you know what I'm saying? Like, you ain't got no, like, like, like where the ice cubes at? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's, none of these things exist anymore, and, and, and I'm having a hard time, like, figuring out why. You know what I'm saying? Why, why is that the case? Why we are not, why are we not producing these things anymore? We never you know owned it, that's why. You know what I'm saying? When you own it, you control it. It's pretty simple, it's like, all of them is everything you name. Those are hit shows, those are iconic. There's absolutely no reason not to continue that unless the 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 the, the ownership decides we don't want to do that no more. We got a completely different agenda and direction. There's no other reason that you stop something that's working besides working too well. You know, like, again, too much representation. This don't work for us on the back end. Or if we're going to allow it to work for them, let's control what it is that's working. You know what I'm saying? Like, I feel like now a lot of the more popular black TV film things that are, like, more black controlled are, like, you know, crime and family drama. Trauma. You know what I'm saying? Selling trauma. And, and I mean, that's because, yeah, we know that 100%. And... That's why I say it's a good and bad to like the anti-hero, playing the villain, our drug shows, like stuff that people actually experience. You know what I'm saying? We know that's there. But if you want to spark the imagination, you have to go to things that we haven't experienced. You know what I mean? But you have to have an intention to do that because somebody has to write it. Somebody has to uh, fund it. You know what I mean? Somebody has to direct and produce it and star in it. So these are elements of people who are intentional about representation, right? So that's why I say, you know, we we get into some of these roles and we do it as much as we possibly can in these roles. So when I see black directors and producers and actors, I know you put as much as you possibly could in that role, but you don't control the editing. You don't control the funding. Right. So we can only be as revolutionary as we're allowed to be. Yeah, no, you know what I'm fact. saying? And then that's cut off. That is a fact, you know. But that's, you know, that's, that's my job to say it. And if anybody want to quote it, it's out there because you... You can't be a hero until you got a strong villain. You know what I mean? A lot of people are afraid of making a strong enemy, but there's no hero tale in the world. There's no change that happens without you pointing at something that needs to be changed, that everybody know needs to be changed, but they know it's dangerous if you go about trying to change it. But the people we look up to, that's what they decided to do. They took that pill of fearlessness and confidence and said that we go conquer. For sure, but they, you know, they try to instill fear in us when they knock those people out. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, they trying to make it so that ain't no more of those people. Mm -hmm. Because this is the consequence of going that far. Mm -hmm. You know. It's but, you know, that's the beauty of life and death, though. It's like, life is continual. You know what I mean? Like, the ancestors that existed before me, like, they lived through me, through my actions. And as I go, they're going to live through somebody else's actions that I inspire. So, if you, yeah, you can't truly live if you're afraid of death. You know what I mean? You can't live a life worth living if you're afraid of death because you're not going to do the things that'll make you truly feel alive. You're going to do the things that keep it safe. I, I ask my students this. What was the life you would live if you was completely fearless? If you could take a pill right now and that would give just you eliminate the ultimate whole confidence and you knew what you do was going to be successful. Anything you try there is going to be successful and you will operate in complete confidence and fearlessness. If you can autom if you can start to imagine a different life, then you already know you're living behind fear. You're living behind insecurity. You know what I mean? So you, we we are in this fight of trying to live the life that we really want to. Instead, we have to live the life that we have to behind our fears and our insecurities. And sometimes we push that edge. We go, we we poke the bear a little bit, but we don't want to wake up to sleeping grizzly. You know what I mean? And and so it's that whole idea of like, don't live the life that you live in now, live the life that you imagine if you was fearless. Live the life that you could imagine if you was completely 100% confident. Your ideas change, your goals change, your circle change. Live the life that you are afraid yeah. of. Yeah, ultimately. Ultimately, you know, this is, this is a quote that resonates with me. Best things in life are on the opposite side of it. You know, and I can say every time I've leaned into a fear of mine, 
there's been nothing but the feeling of progress or success on the other side of that, you know, like instantly, instantaneously, you know what I mean? Like a, like a instant life boost, you know what I'm saying? From facing your fear. That's life. You feel a lot. That's, that's that feeling of everything I do is good enough, right? Because insecurity is based on fear. Never thinking you good enough. People don't get started and they operate from that place. You got to augment the way you look, the way you, to operate the way you like, yeah, you overcompensate right. for what you feel like it is that you lack. Right. And that's not real. And so it's it's trying to get people to exist and appreciate in yourself. Like I'm always good enough. That's why I ain't afraid of putting this idea out. It ain't got to be perfect. There ain't no such thing as perfect. Perfect is just insecurity. After it's already ready. I mean, like we all <laughs> we we all got our own perfect. Yeah. Like you're perfect look different than my perfect. You know what I'm saying? Like like we it's it's perfect because it's what was intended for us to do. Right. You know what I mean? And then once you do that though, the danger is you start changing so many things, like, damn. So if I start living fearless, I might have to get rid of my woman. If I start living fearless, I might have to change my career, I might have to change my job. Like, I don't know if I want to, I got to change too many things if I start living fearless. Yeah, you know, that, that'd be it. Like, you know, it's comfort. Right. People are, uh, gravi- gravitate to comfort. You right. know what I'm saying? It's like, that's what they rather, like most people don't want to, most people are afraid of change. You know what I'm saying? Because that, that shakes them up. It, it It's no longer feels stable. You know what I'm saying? They, they Now it's a wobbly type of ground. They could fall. Or, you know what I'm saying, at any moment. And most people don't like living like that. And, you know, you can't blame them when you think no, about it like yeah. that. I know it, it ain't easy. That's why I tell people, like, you know, don't try to be like me this time. I don't think you want this. You feel me? Like, <laughs> nah, I might make it fact. look good. It's a fact. You, you know, know, even, you know, being successful as a rapper, you know, I've, I've had many moments in my life where, like, maybe dealing with family members where they're looking at my life through a certain lens. They're looking at it from just, like, you know, the end result and the highlights but they don't actually understand what comes with this. You know what I mean? They don't know that like, I'm constantly 24 seven thinking about my life, my safety, the, my my family's safety. You know what I'm saying? They don't know about, you know, the more money, more problems. You know what I'm saying? They don't know the phone calls I deal with. They don't know the, the fucking deposition. You got to sit through the lawsuits, you know what I'm saying? The, 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 the false accusals, the, misjudgment of character, like they don't know about all of those matters. You know what I'm saying? And essentially we all have our own unique struggles. You know what I'm saying? Like like at the at the very basic level of it, we all struggle, but we struggle differently. All our struggles look different. The same way all of our perfections look different. You know what I'm saying? I think the perfection is in knowing and discovering what it is that you can do that nobody else can. Right. You know? Yeah and double down on it Fact. create barriers to competition you know i think sometimes i do it too well and when you do it too well you create enemies but it's like this is true my old thing this is, is true success comes with enemies it's a, a side because it's like this right when you start shining your light you start exposing the darkness in other people and you know they start feeling insignificant. They start feeling smaller around you, or exposed, or vulnerable, or open, or weak, or defenseless. And you know that's all based on what's going on in that person's mind, what's ruling that person's moon and stars, what they psychology is. They really got nothing to do with you. It's you know what I'm saying it's just the fact that they mind is is taking it however they take it. You know what I'm saying where it is a reverse effect of it. They could be looking at it like, yo, you know what? Shit, you are you are exposing this dust in this corner. Maybe I just need to sleep that up. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's that's the 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 realization that everything ain't criticism. Some things are, is a diagnosis. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's like you And go, a lot of people ain't ready to they face, face the diagnosis. They ain't ready man. for that diagnosis. You go to the doctor and he be like, listen, man, you got cancer, bro. <laughs> like, he be like, nah, I don't want to hear that. It's like, same, bro. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like the doc, to me, you know, all all truth is positive. So if a doctor tells you like this, what you got, he did something positive because he told you the truth. Right. He told you what to avoid. Right. Now. Then the person be like, you know what? Forget you. I'm gonna get a second opinion. Get second opinion. They tell man, no, nah, I'm gonna go get a third opinion. If everybody telling you the same thing, it's a diagnosis. You know what I mean? But we don't want to listen to it. We want to no. Tell me what I want to hear. Tell me I'm healthy. Oh, you you, you got issues. <laughs> you sick. You got problems. So we got a society of people that's sick. 
You understand me? And instead of getting a diagnosis time. and focusing on healing, they go into circles of trauma. You understand me? To where people that they can relate to. You know what I mean? And be like, no, we all sick over here. This is normal. Exactly. Even worse, they just spread right. their sickness. Right. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Maybe, then they start tricking us. So maybe the people who healthy got the problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah <laughs> why y'all yeah. want to live so like, long? Why y'all not vaccinated? That's, that's a real thing, <laughs> you know right? Like, like, people be asking, why? You want to be healthy? You want to live long? We got, like, come on. How are you mad at somebody for being it's healthy? It's like that food tastes nasty. Right. You know what I'm saying? That's like, the people who don't want the diagnosis. You know what I mean? And so, a gnosis is knowledge, you feel me? So when somebody gives you the knowledge of self, you know what I mean, and you don't accept it, you live in in sickness, you live in in delusion, you are comfortable in ignorance. Well, that's, you know, that's fixed mindset versus growth mindset again. You know, that just goes back to that because those are the people who don't want to change, ultimately. You know what I'm saying? They don't want to adapt. They don't want to embrace new ideas. And the new idea is that you, your idea can possibly be wrong. You know what I'm saying? Or... There's other ideas. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Your idea is not the only one. There's, um, I forget the ship name. It's a story of this ship. And it's a thought experiment to where they have this old ship. And they say, what if you take that old ship and you start stripping its parts and you start substituting it with new parts? So it get to a point where there are no new parts. Is it still the same ship? Then they double down and say, what if you take those old parts, completely reconfigure it together, is that the is that the old ship or is that the new ship, right? And this idea of continuum, you know what I'm saying? This is this idea about like growth, like just because you get rid of the old parts and you replace it with new parts within yourself doesn't mean you're not you. You understand me? But you're still everything that makes you who you are, right? And so that's an idea that I I, I kind of want people to kind of think about because I like thought experiments in that way because it makes us you know, question life without bias. You know what I mean? I'm not challenging your existing beliefs or anything. It's just saying that, yeah, I mean, just because you rearrange and you've added new perspective, thoughts, and ideology, experiences, and exposure, you're still you, but you improve, right? And so, you know, in life for me, I had to get over that, like, nah, it's okay to, number one, outgrow people, circumstances, and ideas. The person that... It's, it's two things to me. When you create a vision for your life, you have to remember that energy in which you created that vision from. You know what I mean? Because that to me is that, that you know, making sure you don't lose yourself, right? Because then you can get so far from yourself when you look bad, like you can't even recognize yourself anymore. Like, so, yeah, you're still you, but are you the version that started this mission? Or did you allow the mission, you know what I mean, to look, to, to, to take you away from yourself. And so it's, it's a, a key of saying that, no, nah, not only do I go back and I look at the notes of my past self that started this mission, because I don't want to let the environment, the mission, the adventure, all of this changed me so drastically that the core of that root that I started this with, the goodness that I started this with is no longer there. And now I'm doing it just to get there, but I don't even have a feeling anymore. I don't even have those principles and the values attached to what that vision was. So I go back and remind myself, like, who was you that started this? When you said you was 19 Kings, the energy you came with, and you wanted that to transform the world, remember that energy. Because when you start getting money, you start getting position, you start doing these things, you go forget that. You know what I mean? And now you're no longer yourself. You are the mission you sent yourself on, but you're not the person that can continue to conjure those thoughts and do that good. And that's why so many people in... They, they enter new classes and they forget themselves. Like, bro, when you was in my position, you had that vision. The man that makes changes as he grow and he can continue that vision. Like, when I get that money, I'm going to change the world. And he actually get there and he start changing the world. Some people, they get the money. They ain't know I'm just going to keep getting more money. Get all that. I ain't got enough money to change the world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, how I, much? I, 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 ah, damn. I need more money. How, how much more do you I need? I need more money more before money. I change <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> It is okay to, right, like, and it's okay to not have anything and start changing the world. You know what I mean? Because by example, you can change things. You feel me? And I think that that's the key that I learned with them myself. Like, I actually already have everything, right? I probably just can't make every withdrawal I want to make right now. You feel me? But it's already there because spiritually I have a bank account that's set up for me 
God put a lot of money in it, but he set it up like a, a trust fund to where he said, like, like, bro, on power, you can't access everything. Right, right. You understand me? You have to go through and do certain the things. Checkpoints. Then you get it. Checkpoints. So yeah. for me, that's it. Like I'm a trust I'm I'm a I'm a trust fund baby with God. You feel me? <laughs> I have the same belief, you know, when it comes to money, I just I just have an abundance mindset. You know, and I'm not gonna lie, I don't always make the most sound financial decisions because of it, but because of my faith, I don't make decisions based on a lack or scarcity mindset. You know what I'm saying? So I never look at it like I can't afford anything. You know what I mean? I believe I can afford I can afford anything that I put in my mind to. My first financial lesson I taught myself is the more you hold on to a dollar, the more you're gonna need it. Right? And so when I did that, I let things go because I started to operate in the faith that I can always get more. You know what I mean? And so, you know, and that's not to say, you know, I like nice things. I'm a tourist. You know what I'm saying? Me, you know, I like to be high level. You feel me? You see the mint going on right now. Like the mint, you know, you got to do what you got to do. Mint, mint condition. Yeah, mint condition at all times. You know what I'm saying? I meant that. You feel me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> at that part. <laughs> you feel me? But in that sense, you got to, you know, you got to keep your treasury up. So, you know, for me, financial intelligence is key. And I'm I, as I teach, I'm learning at the same time, right? Like, we living in, uh, in turmoil times to where banks are collapsing, interest rates are high, you know, um, the world is in a, in a state of uncertainty, right? The de-skilling of America where people's skills ain't worth nothing because you got AI. So people are uncertain about their future. And, you know, it makes this generation uncertain about life. Like, what do I do? And so there increased stress, increased anxiety, increased depression, constantly on the rise, you know, and, and, and the idea of just telling people, number one, so I like that story of, like, you got that magical stone. You're just not realizing it, you know what I mean? But when you stop and you close your eyes, you can imagine a new world. And as long as you can imagine a new world, that means that it's possible, right? So the greatest wealth a man can have is his mind, a sound and stable mind. Right. So whatever we got going on in the world, you know, you always have to pull back and be like, nah, I'm losing my wealth right now, but I might be gaining money. You know what I mean? Because your wealth is your health. That's where it comes from. Right. So everybody has to draw back. And for black people, we have to look at our spiritual health because we're very spiritual people. And so sometimes we look at mental health, but the mental health doesn't always tell us why we're not aligned. Oh, I'm doing the meditation. I'm doing this. But spiritually, Where's your integrity? Spiritually, where's your values? Is what you're doing aligned with your true essence of character? And when you, when it's not, your spiritual health starts to fail. Yeah, and you'll never be truly still, like, happy. Right. You know, like a long-lasting version of right. that, at least. You know what I'm saying? You'll always feel, like, maybe just content enough right. to continue doing what it is that you're doing. Do you, you think know? you're happy? Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Absolutely. I can say that without a doubt because... Why wouldn't I be happy? You know what I'm saying? Like, like every day, that's why I start my day in a state of gratitude. Because, you know, something, I had a breakthrough back in 2020, and abundance was the word that resonated with me, like, deep into my subconscious. And, and, and it really changed me. Because in that moment of stillness during the pandemic, I finally got a moment to stop and smell the roses. You know, like with this life that a lot of us lead, it's seldom any moments of silence. You know what I mean? Like, you know, meditation is key, but we don't always get the time to meditate. You know what I'm saying? Like that alarm ring, you you out that theta state and you back into this world, you know what I mean? And it's like everything is shaky and, 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 and things of that nature. So, you know, in that stillness, in that silence was the word abundance that came to me. And what it told me was, we are all abundant. Like, we might not have the thing, everything that we want, but we have everything that we need to get to what, what it is that we want. And that alone is a feeling of infinite. You know what I'm saying? Like, like it, it, the infinite is readily available to us. You know what I'm saying? And then what you also got to realize is, you might want something that somebody has more than you. But you have to also acknowledge the reversal of that. There's something that you have more than them. You know what I'm saying? So that right there alone should neutralize any type of jealousy or envy or like longing to 
you know, want something that you already don't have because we already have everything that we need. You know what I'm saying? So that was something that ultimately changed me. And, and, and now that's why every day is so important for me to pray and to realize that. You know what I'm saying? And that is a part of my happiness is knowing that, you know, I'm, I'm abundant and, and there's not a single thing that I can't have that I want, you know, if I really put my mind towards it. But then also even deeper, I know that I'm aligned with my purpose. You know what I'm saying? I know that everything that I'm doing is adding on to the greater thing. Like, even when it comes to the people around me who work for me, like every now and again, I want to be reassured that what it is that they're doing with me aligns with their end goal or their life's purpose. Because when it no longer aligns, I feel like that's the moment where a change has to be made. You know what I'm saying? Because I never want to be held against my will. Therefore, I never want to keep anybody held against their will. You know, I'm the type of person where we got to make it work for both of us. You know what I'm saying? It can't just work for me because if it just works for me, I'm never going to get what I actually need. From you. you know what I'm saying? Because what I need from you is that you know that this is working for you as well. You know what I mean? It's just a different level of output and understanding and collaboration of that energy that way. Right, man. Because, cause, like, I got a lot of employees now. I say that payroll. Well, yeah, yeah, <laughs> I yeah, got to yeah. take a breather on that one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that one. Yeah. It's just for yeah. God. <laughs> well, all right, got some anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, you know, it, it's like I've been working, playing around with this AI stuff, and the AI really... As you try to get the most out of AI, you learn your own thinking process, right? It's kind of like hiring a person and trying to manage it to get the best output, right? And working with people is like that as well. How do I give you the best environment and put you in the best structure and the best role and give you the best mission and give you the best prompt so to bring the best out of you so then I can get return and you get return, right? And it's a tough challenge because People don't want to work no more in the sense of having a very hard work ethic. It's been drilled into us, don't work hard, don't work hard, don't work hard, don't work hard. And I think people took that the wrong way, right? Because I'm all about self-sufficiency and doing meaningful work, right? Um, and the sense of, like, there's certain opportunities that you can't waste. Like, if a person want a job, find it, Right? There's people that, you know, in my operation, they f I, 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 I like creating long relationships with people. When I see you do good and you have a certain mindset, I want to work with you. But I only want to work with people, like you say, have a growth mindset, have a leadership mindset. Because for me, working with people is collaborating with them, right? I think it was MSNBC saying that how the number one skill that people want is the art of collaborating with others, right? Because everybody doesn't know how to work with a lot of people. And I have that skill set I believe a lot from when I was younger, I jumped around to so many different places. Like ever since I was in middle school, I went to a different school every year up until my one year in college that I did. And I am and I got a lot of brothers and sisters, so I'm always moving around, putting on different crowns. So now I know how to deal with people as if they my brothers. You feel me? Like when I met you, it's like me and one of my brothers. You feel me? Because I got a brother who's just like you. You feel me? So it's like that to me, there's there's no... Um, prep work. There's no faking. There's no nothing I got to do. I just got to be myself. But that's a skill set that you have to learn when it comes to networking with people, collaborating with people, speaking to people, talking with people, right? And so we at this point in this time, though, what people have to learn how to get back to a point where you have a great work ethic. Everybody wants to live a very soft life, and I get it. You know, it feel like we just been working for 500 years almost. <laughs> but like, Things don't get built great by waiting. You know what I mean? Things, great things don't get built by lazy people unless you're you know, super creative. Something I'm learning right now, too, is that it's never hard. It's just new. It's just different. You know what I'm saying? It's only hard because it's not the current experience. It's not what you're used to. You haven't adapted it yet. So it's, it's, it's the, I like that. It's the idea of making it a new habit that's hard. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's the consistency that's hard because this is a new thing. It's out of, you know, your your everyday scope of what you are, what you're doing. You know what I'm saying? It requires you to put your energy towards a different thing. And that's what's actually hard. But the task or whatever it is that needs to be done is that hard, especially if it's part of what you need to do. You know what I'm saying? There's no way that is hard. Like, like if 
If you want to make a million dollars and I tell you, yo, this is a way you get $10,000 a day, that should not be hard. It, it should be it should be nothing hard. Yeah, you should be excited. You should be showing up every day with a smile on your face to do whatever the fuck it is. You know what I'm saying? As long as, you know, it aligns with you, you know, more of it shit. <laughs> but yeah. still, you feel me? Like, you hustling, you hustling. Right. You're going to get it how you see it. But it's never hard. It's just new. Yeah, so from, I, I, I like that. And that, that made me think about, like, just replacing certain terms, you replace the connotation connected to it. So instead of hard work, you're doing good work. You know what I mean? And when you do good work, you should be infinitely energized to do that. You know what I mean? Like, no, I'm doing good work. Like, this is actually benefiting, and this is making progress. Right. It's, it's, it's also like, you know, people got to understand they have to increase the rapport with themselves. You know what I'm saying? You have to prove to yourself who you are. Even when, like, you know, going back to goals, right? A lot of people year after year set these goals and then they come back to their list at the end of the year and, like, all of these goals are not completed. And then what happened? Silently, subconsciously, they're beating themselves up. Chest eyes. They're beating the shit out of themselves. Uh -huh. You know what I'm saying? And what that's doing is destroying the rapport that you have with yourself. So now, every time you don't meet those things, you get further and further away from believing in your own power. You know what I'm saying? It's the opposite of encouragement. It's discouragement. You know what I'm saying? So we have to get better at setting these checkpoints or these tasks for ourselves and, you know, forming that relationship with self that you can get certain things done. You know what I mean? Like, okay, you got to go. You minimize it into some action items for the week or for the day or for the month, ultimately, however you want to minimize and maximize. And once you you know, do that on a consistent basis, you start to tell yourself, I can do this. I can see it, you know what I mean? But like when people don't do that, it's really no belief. It's just an idea, you know what I'm saying? It's a desire, but there's no action behind it. Mm. Yeah. yeah, that's powerful, because th just the idea of designing your life, you know, the way that you want to see it. Like for me, I always think about designing my life. Like everything is designed, because good design right. enhances things. Right. You feel me? And that's the thing is like people don't want to take heed to the fact that they have to design them their their lives. Nobody's gonna do it for you. Nobody's gonna come and walk up to you one day like this is how you need to be living your life. No, that is you. You have to design it. You know, and what that's saying? what good habits do. Because good habits it, it it produces better design. Like if you look at the way your life is designed right now, how you wake up, what you eat, like all of that is producing the life you live in. So if you change the design, you get a different outcome. So people think changing the goals get a different outcome. No, it's changing the design of your life. For me, the type of design I am, I'm very visual. So when it comes to shit that I got to get done, I got to see that it's, I got to see what God has to be, I have to see it all laid out, and then I have to also see it completed. Like, I like to see checks. You know what I'm saying? Like, because that, that strengthens my rapport with myself. How much checks I got on my to-do list today? Okay, if I, if I had 10 things to do in a day and I got, I, I did eight of them, I'm like, I'm 80%. I'm a B plus for the day. You know what I'm saying? This is this is increasing my record. So now the next day, I'm like, right, I was a B plus. I could either stay at a B plus or I could be an A. But if I go backwards, then I'm gonna know, all right, nah, nah, tomorrow, now nah, I gotta come back on my A game. You know what I'm saying? Because I believe people are depressed when they can no longer measure their progress or when they stop measuring. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's why I feel like a good tool for a lot of people is exercise, going to the gym, because that's some way, that's a, that, like, you know, progress a lot of the time is imperceptible. You can't see it, especially if you're not designing your life the proper way, you're not writing this shit out so you can keep track of everything that you are actually complete, completing. Like most of us, we complete something and we're right on to the next thing, right away. You know what I'm saying? So. And you got, that's why celebrating the small wins. Like, I like that track in progress, stopping to celebrate, you know, uh, things that you deserve. Like, I did that. And stopping and letting yourself know you did that. Like, yeah, you're on the right path. Rather than you did that, and it don't feel like you did nothing because you ain't stopped to mark that down. So now you at where you at, and you've actually made a lot of progress, but it don't feel like it because you didn't give yourself the markers along the path. You feel me? So... That's key for me, and that's why I've been celebrating a little bit lately. And now you got to, you got to celebrate, because I feel like life is a series of small wins and tiny breakthroughs, and all they do is compound. And a lot of people, 
especially our people, I feel like are so foreign to the idea of compound. Compound interest is not just a money term. It's, a, it's actually a thought term more than anything. Because you got to compound your thoughts the right way. You got to consistently, persistently think in the right direction. You know what I'm saying? It's like, okay, the, med the distance between Earth and the moon can be broken down to a matter of inches when you really think about it. So every day you got to inch forward to the right direction. And like, you know, after six months, those inches are meters, are, are feet, are, are yards, are miles. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But it's like people, most people cannot, they don't have that long-term play instilled in their minds. It's, it's all instant. It's like, what can I get right now? What can I see right now in front of my face? And, you know, that's, I think, if I look at the vastness of, like, human beings and our species, there's only so many, people don't like when I say this, but there's only so many interested human beings in the world, right? Because, you know, everybody doesn't make progress. There's usually somebody who makes progress for everybody else, right? That's why, you know, the average person don't know how to recreate the TV or the phone or the scientific or medical, right, inventions, right, or agriculture. So there's some people that come about and they create and they add a design to the world. And what it does for humanity is, yes, it gets us inches and inches closer and everybody else gets the privilege of being there after that time. Nobody that has it, whether you created the cell phone or you created the plane or whatever it is, everything is a continuum and extension because you get to study everything other human beings have done and discovered and now it's not that you were smarter than everybody else. You came after everybody else's curiosity and failures and experimentation and thoughts and your idea is right for your time, right? But human being collective consciousness is a collaboration. So what I'm doing now is a collaboration with all those who came before. This is why and I have all the those insight. who will come after and well. all those who come after. I'm I'm a part of this. I don't look at the vastness of the world and think I'm small. Like, no. Size is Size is not a measurement of value. You understand me? It's like the, the 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 ants and the bees are just as important as the elephants, right? So for me, when people say, well, the universe is huge, don't you feel small? No, nah, I'm a part of it. <laughs> I'm, if I'm a part of it, I'm connected to the whole of it. You understand me? And so the whole is not just one thing. It's, it's the breakdown of all of the integral parts that's inside of it. So there's no such thing as large. Everything is broken down, right? I'm an atomic structure. So when I think about that, being a part of a team, I can't be bigger than the team. I'm only my team. You understand me? Like, people That's don't why think they about say health. You're only, you're only as big as my heart. Right. That's why they say you're only as strong as the weakest link on your team. Exactly. Because it's, it's, it's all interconnected, right? And so you can't get past that. Or it takes one to sink the ship. People focus a lot on nutrition, body-wise. You know, I'm going to feed this particular system of the body. I'm going to feed that system. Very rarely do people speak about the mind. Very rarely do speak, people speak about the brain. The brain needs the most energy, right? The brain is uh, needed to process. The brain is needed to, you know, compartmentalize. The brain is needed for so many things, you know, but we don't know what brain food looks like, you know? We know that the body's electrical, and what I understand about gold is not only is it super conductive, but it's non-corrosive and it's a noble element. So they say that if I am what I eat, I want to be noble. You know what I'm saying? I want to be of the highest degree. And I also want to focus on mental health. I want to focus on gut health. I want to focus on energy. I want to focus on youth. I want to focus on, uh, you know, accessing uh, pineal activity, hormonal balance, everything that gold represents is what I want to see more of. So what better thing to do but align myself with this particular product and get it out to as many people as I can by singing the praise of gold, which is something that our people have been doing for over 10,000 years. Relationships and women, right? It's a serious subject. It's a lot of stuff going on in the world. It's a lot of, but they call it gender wars. I don't believe in gender wars. I think it's just dissatisfied people discussing their traumas with other dissatisfied yeah. people. Well, maybe not genders, but agendas. Agendas, oh, for surely. But you know why I said that? It's not that it don't exist, but, you know, belief constitutes reality. 
You know what I mean? So the more that we believe into it, the more we're adding and feeding this entity that continues to grow every day and we normalize it at that Absolutely, becomes. absolutely. So are you married? I'm not married. You're not married? So what's going on in the Joey Badass department? Because you told me that you, you, you read reading the book about the five languages of love, so you have to be adding to your repertoire you understand me to enhance your chances of whatever you got going on in the world. You know, I'm not married, but um, I'm the type of person who, you know, I've, I'm a growth mindset type of person. You know, I want to grow, and it's not limited to one area. I want to grow in all areas. So, you know, if I'm going to become a better man, part of that is becoming a better lover. Part of that is understanding my emotions on a heightened level. I thought you were talking about polygamy at first. Oh, um, is that is that what she was getting at? No, I wasn't getting that when you said growth mindset. I thought yeah, yeah, yeah. he was adding the different segue. Part. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but continue. Nah, nah, that's nah. that's, what, know, that's where you was going. No, nah, I'm, I'm just saying, you know, in general, for me, where I'm at in my love life is there's a lot of how can I put this? Um, you know, I'm just seeking new ways on how I could become a better lover. You know, I'm I'm as a grow, growth mindset individual. I'm always open to new ideas or to new perspectives, new understandings, you know, as long as they align with my principles and my values, of course. But, um, you know, lately I just completed the book, The Five Love Languages for Men. You know, that was a mainstream book that I saw for years that I just never got into because it was just one of those things. I guess I judged the book by its cover. You know what I'm saying? But now actually reading it, it actually, you know, gave me a lot of beneficial knowledge that I feel like is tied to a lot of things that I've experienced in my love life. You know what I'm saying? A lot, like a lot of the times we try to love people in the ways that we want to be loved and we, we totally ignore what they actually want. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, just little, little things like that. But ultimately one day I do want to be, you know, a husband. I see you say, you know, it was one of the interviews you was talking, I think it was a breakfast club where they act like, you know, Conscious, because you was conscious, you don't get women or something. They didn't associate it yeah, with like yeah, you yeah, yeah. I thought that was funny as hell. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was funny. Yeah. But I, I asked because a lot of, I, I feel like game is no longer being given nowhere in the world. You know what I'm saying? And like people are trying to figure out how to do relationships again. You know what I mean? Um, it's like the script is being rewritten by people who don't know how to write the script. You know what I mean, and there's just conversations the about blind leading to, the blind. That's all it is. Yeah. And the people that have the biggest problems are the loudest. You know what I mean? So people are always relating to nothing but trauma. It's like they get out of a relationship and they go voice it to the world. And now instead of focusing on self improvement and healing, because those are the people that should be listening the most rather than having a louder speaker phone where they're just broadcasting trauma, like relationship dynamics in the world are changing vastly. You understand me? Like Everybody don't believe in marriage anymore. I know. You know? Yeah, it's crazy. Um, the, the the rules are changing for what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. You feel me? And I want us to get to a place where we know how to interact with each other. You know what I mean? Like, if you can first come up with your defining, like, what does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be a woman? And I seen a clip where there was older women talking to a younger girl about, and they, she was asking them questions about like modern dating and the older women was giving their perspective like mamas. And it was so clearly different, right? And you got a lot of young people and a lot of times we go out there and act like, you know, we the wisest in the world. We give our advice and we still at the point where we should be listening. We could be like children when it comes to that. And the reality of it is, is that we need more, like in order to become a man, you have to learn from a man right, or men, or like, you know, those rules or orders, those principles. Or to become a woman, you gotta learn from a real woman, or a good woman, I should say, and a good man. You understand me? So for you, what's your definition of a good man? What's your definition of a good woman? My definition of a good man is a man who is aligned with his purpose. You know what I'm saying? A man who understands what his purpose is and carries that out in various type of ways in the course of a day, the course of a lifetime, ultimately. and my definition of a good woman is a woman who is aligned with love and, you know, the desire of her heart. You know what I'm saying? And, um, but that doesn't mean that a man can be aligned with love or that a woman can be aligned with purpose. So that's, that's how I see it. For yeah. Sure. That video you did with the sister, what's her name? 
Soraya. Soraya. Yeah. yeah, that was a fire video. Yeah. You understand me? What Appreciate made you come that. up with that concept? I mean, so the song, ultimately, you know, on the song Show Me is me detailing pretty much like an experience that I had in a past relationship where ultimately I wanted the truth. I wanted, you know, things communicated to me. I wanted transparency because I was given transparency. But what I had to learn was that it was a lesson because a lot of women are afraid to communicate to men the truth. And for me, it gave me the lesson that sometimes we have to be aware uh, if we're setting enough a safe space environment, enough for like a woman to come forward and feel safe enough and protected enough to share with us what the truth is. Right. You know what I'm saying? Because, you know, there's, there's, there's different fears. I mean, you know, we're the stronger ones. I'm gonna wild out and, you know, this, that, the third. So it was an experience with me where I wanted to tell that story where, you know, here's this imperfect relationship with its tiny flaws, but, you know, two people still fighting through, you know, the flaws and, and, and you know, showing a woman, giving a woman a safe space to make mistakes and ultimately, you know, be forgiven. Yeah. So is that where you feel like you at right now? Like, let's say, scenario, if a woman was to cheat on you, you, you mature enough, you know what I mean, to let her make that mistake and then y'all continue on with the relationship? Well, I think it depends. I don't, don't want to say mature enough. I don't know if that's the word to say, like, that's... You mature because you can do that, but well, you know, it depends. I don't at this point in my life, I don't see myself engaging in a relationship with a woman who had the tendency to cheat on me. But you know, <laughs> in, in, in a strange situation or, or a rare situation, I guess it would have to be measured by what the circumstance is or whatever. But I mean, ideally, I just don't see myself being in that position. Like I'm not. I'm. That's not where my focus is at all. Like if I'm gonna engage with a woman is because that's a 0% chance in my mind. At least it's not like even a, there's no shadow of doubt. So that's me? a no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a no. That's what that was. That's a political no. <laughs> a political no, right? Shit, I mean, shit, call it what it is. I just, yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? Nah, it's, I it's, feel you, I'm, I'm coming there with I, it. I feel like, you know, you want to say no right away, but Right. I feel like there's different aspects once you get there. What does that look like? You know what I'm saying? Like, what is, who is this person to you? What have they done for you? What have you done for them? What have y'all done for each other? What have y'all built together? I feel like there's so many things to consider and every situation is unique. So it was like, yeah, while the man in me immediately would say no, it's like, I don't know. You feel me? Like, I, I, don't, I don't know what that looks like, ultimately. You know what I'm saying? So I don't know how I would deal with it from situation to situation and person to person. Yes, sir. You know, that's respect it. You understand me? Um, I often let the man in me just speak sometimes. And then I, I scale back from there. You know what I'm saying? So I can understand in that particular type of situation, it's, 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 it's a huge sign that says no. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, for <laughs> sure. I mean, it's a big no. Like, like I feel like the no, don't do that to me, is written on my face. Yeah. You feel me? I got to fight through that no <laughs> to try to find it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was, it's, it's a needle in a haystack, man. Yeah, man, I worry that. But, you know, I, I only bring that up because, you know, the, the idea, the challenges around where the world sees masculinity and what actual masculinity is, because masculinity is a good thing the same way femininity is a good thing. Right, and men have the capabilities and, and are understanding. We can be vulnerable, we can be gracious, we can be, we can have great emotional intelligence. All these different things can exist, but oftentimes the narrative is only showcasing the toxic traits, right, while ignoring the good. And men and women both make mistakes, sometimes of equal standing, right? And so when we get to a place where we give each other grace, you know what I mean, room to grow, room to develop, room to ally, to become better human beings, that's when we at our highest level. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, ultimately right now there's an agenda against masculinity, especially in the black culture. Like, I don't feel like there's too much amplified representations of true masculinity. You know what I'm saying? Everything is pointed towards like a softer side for men. And like the only, I guess, glorified aspects of masculinity is the toxic side. You know what I'm saying? Like when you look at something like hip hop, especially, you know, like the, street life and you know the the the, the killing of each other the black death you know what i'm saying that's like the most visual form of masculinity for us and it's it's 
it's the wrong kind. Right, because you know that's, that's hyper-masculinity more so. Like, I was giving this breakdown of, like, when you look at timeline in America, during the 60s, it was a very revolutionary time for us, right? It was very politicized. A lot of brothers that came from the war, you know what I mean? They had tactics and strategies that they was implying. There was a, a, a vast black consciousness movement in America, and it was more Afrocentric, and people was essentially going against the system. Right. And then that was disrupted by the groovy 70s of psychedelics and European fashion and pimping. Right. Because people always point to the 70s were like them brothers was. And that was the height of pimps in the 70s. Pimps don't represent masculinity. Right. And so there's this whole dichotomy of thinking to where when we, we point back to other eras of toxicity. Right. To narrate and validate the toxicity that we're going through now. Right, because masculinity isn't toxic. It's the lack of masculinity that's toxic in the world. Right, it's the same way. Just ask if a boy grows up with a father versus without a father, he has a better chance. Right, because he don't have that masculine energy within same his thing life. With a girl. Same thing with women. Yeah. So it's the lack of right. And so when we put the fathers back in the world, that energy back in the world, it automatically creates a balance. You know what I mean? That's the formula. So for me, it's is being a representation of that every single day, you understand me? Um, and making sure that I'm intentional because if they have their agenda, I got mine. And nobody, and it's so blatant today, nobody can say there's no agenda. Agenda just mean that there's a there's a, some things that a person want to get done. There's items. You don't you can't make a movie without an agenda. You can't make a song without an agenda. You can't put together an event without agenda. There's no organization. There's nothing that's ever been successfully carried out without an agenda. The government has agenda, politics, everything. So you just have to ask yourself, what's your agenda? Whose agenda do you serve? It's not whether it's there or not, it's whose side are you on? What side are and what are you participating in? A lot of times unknowingly. And this is where I feel like most of the world are victims of their own ignorance because they don't know that they're carrying out an agenda. Right? And for me, I believe that human beings have already reached their highest level. And we're mutated into something else now because we're not comfortable with who we truly are. We have this place of insecurity in society. Every Nobody can just, people don't just look in the mirror and say, you know what, I'm comfortable with the way I look. I don't want to change nothing. You know what I mean? Now we got artificial intelligence, you got filters, you got all these different things to where the world is no longer natural. Right? So you can say in a time where we're going through the most extreme side effects of reality, you know, that this is normal and this is healthy. We're in the highest level of mental illness to ever exist in society. We have the highest level of technology, but the highest lack of spirituality, right? And so spiritual movements and mass awakenings and realizations and enlightenment, you know, this is how we start to correct those orders and systems. And looking back at the healthy things that we built, saying that, okay, yes, there were issues and problems, but that doesn't mean you throw the baby out of the bathwater. Nah, you go out and you say, okay, let's diagnose this, let's fix this, let's make it more vast and more efficient, right? And any agendas that come from the top are not good from the people at the bottom because what they're trying to do is maintain the status quo. And they also lack perspective. Absolutely. And that's the greatest thing that we have because our perspective shapes our reality. You feel me? So that's why, you know, I'm like, we got to get Joey Badass on the show because you represent masculinity, you know what I'm saying? And, and that's a key to stand on. Right. And that shouldn't even be radical. That's the cold part about it. Being a man is now a radical thing. Right. Integrity is now a radical thing because so many people don't have it. You know what I mean? Common sense is now rare sense. You know what I mean? Because so many people ain't lack so common, it. Man. So true. I want to thank you for coming. Um, I want to thank you for being here for this high level conversation, because as we continue to grow, we continue to execute the ideas of individuals like myself and the good brother Joey, I think are necessary because there's a lack of representation in the world. You know, the reason I wanted to have a good brother Joey Badass on because I believe that, you know, he is a representation um, of masculinity, specifically in his profession as an artist. And it's necessary. Like I said, these things should not be radical. These things should be normal. And the goal is to normalize this again, you know, and tap it into one's true self, you know, going through that, that process, going through that alchemy of self and maintaining self-discipline, maintaining self-realization, maintaining some sense of focus in this world is key. And there's so many young women and men that lack representation, 
right? Like growing up, I don't see myself on the screen. It's always made fun of of being conscious, which is about being self-aware, which is crazy to me. It's being aware of what's happening in the world. The word woke has now been weaponized to mean something completely different. When it used to mean being aware of the state of reality and the system and, you know, all of the negative and positive things that go on in the world. And now it's been politicized the same way masculinity has been politicized, right? Music started off as a form of expression and art and now it's been weaponized, right? Because of many different things, specifically capitalism. And it's nothing wrong with making money, but when the, those who control it have an agenda that's not connected to those who actually produce the music, and it can be detrimental to our communities and our neighborhoods. And that means that we have to get back into control of this. We have to take control once more and take ownership. And there's nobody gonna do it but us. Nobody gonna teach that young boy some game or give him some knowledge of self so that he can correct his path before he even go off the beaten path. You understand me? And we don't have rites of passage anymore. We can't look at people as an example one week and we loving them in the next week, they doing something completely left field. We need consistency, we need stabilization. Biggest issue that people are having today is not a lack of access or nothing, it's lack of being able to use a mind, have some focus, sit down for a second because people are completely distracted and we over procrastinate. You know, so everybody has dreams, everybody wanna be an artist, right? But you have to make sure that's connected to who you truly are because then it becomes your North Star. Then it can guide you and you can use your art to do some good in the world. Then when you go into different rooms, you stay representing who you are. You don't change from your environment, you change your environment. You add something into the algorithm. In the movie Matrix, Neo was able to go in and out the Matrix, right? He didn't look like his environment. Everywhere he walked, they had the black, they was cloaked, you know, they was fly and they disrupted the environment everywhere they went because they was adding something different because that's how you knew those were the ones. Right, they're not they're in the environment, but not of it. That's a power. So as you go on your journey of self-discovery, you go on your journey of self-fulfillment and you have your dreams and your goals and your desires, be careful, maintain yourself. It's okay to bring God in a room with you. If God ain't in a room with you, devil there, he definitely waiting for you. You understand me? And you making a deal with somebody at the end of the day. So this has been your high level conversation and I want everybody to continue to progress towards their highest level. You can't be satisfied with the status quo, but that'll never get you to that God body state. If you want to get into mint condition, tap into high level conversations. I'm 19 Keys. It's been Joey Badass. Tap in for the next episode. I'll see you. Brother, appreciate Thanks, you. Dog. Appreciate your keys. I'm 19 Keys, and this is high level conversations. Tap in with the God. Um, I would say. One key I'd give is visualization. It's important to envision where you want to go so you could ultimately crystallize your reality into, you know, from, from where you're currently at to that end point or end goal. You know what I'm saying? Like, you got you to gotta design your life. You got to lay it all out. Nobody's going to do it for you. You know what I'm saying? So at some point, you got to sit in some type of stillness and you know, put your vision to paper. You know what I'm saying? Well, I think I said it before, like Joey Badass, uh, he represents that masculine energy and tone, I feel like in music and in hip hop, and even his characters that he chooses to play, you know, he has consciousness um, and the way that he represents and carries himself. And at the meeting of brother, and I see the fold of the people that he's around, he has that staple brotherhood that's necessary to stay grounded in this industry. And he's a person that takes his time as crafting himself as an artist. And he reminds me of myself a lot, right? He's younger than me, but, you know, he reminds me of myself in a comparison of, you know, we're multifaceted. People may, at one point in time, they tried to box him in as like just this conscious rapper, boom bap rapper, right? But he always seen himself as more, but people couldn't really understand the, the multifacetedness, you understand me, of his character. And so, I wanted to sit down with him because I know for a fact that when you're exposed to the different elements of knowledge um, and you have something to add to a conversation, right, that can be brought out, whether it's mental health, spiritual journey, right, just development as an artist, how do you maintain your integrity while maintaining celebrity, right? And I thought that that was key. Uh, 
So yeah, Joey Badass was really a, a no-brainer. There's a lot of young cats in hip hop. I like to have a, a dope new generation that I look up and I'd be like, yo, hip hop has a future because of them and Joey Badass is one of them. When it comes to fear, the more you think about it, the more it shows up in your life. So my approach with it is almost not acknowledging it. Or, or no, no, I, I, I actually it's the opposite. It's acknowledging it and leaning right into it. You know what I mean? Because I know that with fear, I have limitation. And if I have limitation, then I can't grow ultimately to, you know, what I want to become. And the quote is, you know, the best things in life are on the opposite side of fear. And indeed they are. Because once you knock those, you know, those fears out the way, you feel more powerful each time. You feel more successful each time. You feel, you know, like you've progressed. Even with his idea about the Hip Hop Council, you know, that's very close guarded in the way that I think, right? Uh, we're, we're entering a time where it's not about one person, it's about a council, right? And so that idea of even thinking about how do we safeguard this treasure, this, this magic called hip hop, and those who have made it to high levels of esteem, you know, uh, them setting it up in a way where we're creating a ship and everybody can go this direction. Like, where's the standards? Where's the movement? And those who are at the top, they know who they are. Those who have the ability, they know who they are. But instead of being the quote unquote gatekeepers, you know, we have to be the kingdom builders, right? Because I feel like we have, we, we, we keep the gate, but we don't own the kingdom. You know what I'm saying? And like, so for me, creating that collective is like setting it up for us to own the kingdom, but also setting it up in a matter to where we control the agenda of hip hop. And that's one thing that we don't do. We don't control the agenda of hip hop. We can add to the flavor of hip hop, the rhythm of hip hop, what's going on, but somebody else controls the agenda by them being able to dominate, you know, the sound that's out there. And if you create a council, you're creating a standard of operation, right? In which you can help usher in. And as you see music as this vehicle to help you know, push culture forward to its highest level. Because music, as much as it's weaponized against us, right, it can be used as a tool, right? Music is a very powerful instrument, maybe the most powerful in the world, right? Because music is a universal language. And so imagine creating a council where now we have the ability to help guide it and use it in a manner to where it's best suited. So when hip hop is being shipped out and exported because this is our number, as black people, music is our number one export. So when we put the energy and the intention and the lyrics and the conversation and the culture, we're shipping our culture around the world through music. We're shipping our influence. We're, we're, we're telling the world how to see us, how to reflect us, how to treat us, how to greet us. So when we go out in Africa, they say, what's up nigga? That's because we ship to them that greeting of that's who we are and that's how you treat us. Right? And so Instead, what if we ship into them with gods? You a god. This is what we're going through. This is what we came from. This is what we represent. You know, otherwise I feel like hip hop has a, um, it, it, it has uh, a struggle to maintain relevancy in a world that does not, that no longer wants toxicity. You know, uh, when we look at Afrobeats, Afrobeats has a very positive energy and rhythm and it makes you happy, you know what I'm saying? But hip hop doesn't always have that, right? And the pace of hip hop can be too fast paced, the, the, the energy and the lyrics, you know, and it can stress people out and give you more anxiety than it would actually, you know, motivate you or inspire you. And our music should not be, you know, um, a drug with side effects, right? It should be a herb that heals, you feel me, and cares us and allows us to go into different states of consciousness by just listening. Like I talked about the Mozart effect, where Mozart music actually, you know, helps increase your spatial IQ and increase your reasoning. Like I should listen to your music and it should make me smarter. I'm not saying that you've got to be extra smart and throw all of this stuff in there, but like there should be more than a balance there should be an abundance of yo as listening to this music it's increasing your mentals we listen to 444 that increased the wealth you know what i'm saying like people started thinking different outside of their boxes like jay-z did that right so like even the idea of like diddy buying bt black entertainment television has a direct correlation with music and hip-hop 
right? It's the only hip hop awards that is like the biggest one that actually has maintained a sense of relevancy. But imagine if it's black owned. Imagine if the culture owns the culture. So I like what Diddy is doing because he's one of those CEOs, what he did with Revolt. You know, he has me on, he has EYL and a bunch of different people, and at least it's pushing the envelope, right? So you need to have a council because people need to be able to check each other, right? It can't just be one person that leads all of this because ain't no one person perfect. But in a council, right, there's strength in numbers and people can feel more comfortable making dangerous decisions because they're not doing it alone, right? And so it's not saying just some council of OGs that's telling these young, you know what I mean, what to do with things of that nature, but no, we, we died in this thing so that we can have progress. And we died in this thing as artificial intelligence and new tools come about and society starts to change. We controlling media, we controlling music, right? And guess what happens when you do that? You control the culture, which means you control the world. But you can't do that if you don't own yourself. For me, my definition of a high-level converse- conversation is synonymous to putting a plant in the sunlight. You know what I'm saying? It's a, a conversation where two, in- two or more individuals could walk away from and feel more magnetized to their purposes. You know what I'm saying? Or whatever it is that their life missions are, to feel more called and attracted to whatever that is. What inspired me to bring forth that vision in my video and to show, you know, the practice of voodoo, spirituality, is that, you know, I, I I have a strong desire for black people to wake up and realize their magic, their power within. And I feel like voodoo is a great start because it's something that they took from us and they turned against us that made us afraid of ourselves. You know what I mean? And it's also a gateway to spirituality. You know what I'm saying? Like there's a lot of spookism that in, that exists in the current society today that blocks us from our true spiritual power because ultimately we are afraid of the things that we should be leaning into. So, you know, for me, that that was the goal. I wanted to show, you know, kids my age and younger and older even generations older than me you know what i'm saying like i wanted them to sh- i wanted to show them that i understand our representation and ultimately they can as well and we don't have to be fearful of it we don't have to be scared of our own culture scared of ourselves you know ultimately you know i wanted to i wanted it to inspire black people to you know learn about themselves and gain that knowledge of self and then open those spiritual doors. We talked a lot about agendas. Um, We talked about spirituality. We talked about voodoo a bit. We talked about, you know, um, being a visionary, maintaining integrity. We talked a lot about mental health because it's so necessary uh, in this world. And this part of you know recharging and being careful with the relationships and the things that you create because they create attachments i want to say something about the art of thinking in life you have to be a strategist there's a book called the book of five rings i think everybody should read bushido is a master samurai warrior and as a master samurai warrior he learns the way of right the sword he learns the way of strategy. Everything has a way of. If you're a psychologist, right, you learn the way of the mind. You learn the, the literature, the resources, right? You learn to study the mind and how it works. If you are a carpenter, you learn the way of the hammer and the nails and the tools, right? And, you know, um, how to measure things and balance. Everything has a way of. And once you learn the way of, it gives you the ability to strategize, right? And strategy is this thing where when you detach, it gives you options versus when you react. You can only do what your monkey mind tells you to do. You can only do what your training tells you to do. If you're not trained and you're going to do something, you know, and you're going to make a mistake and you're going to make the wrong move. And so in life, as you hear us talking, we talked about going to the gym. We talked about the intentionality of purpose. We talked about the growth mindset versus the fixed mindset. And when you have a growth mindset, you are a strategist. You're always learning the way of, especially if you're introducing yourself to new fields. As a thought leader, I created a show 
right? It becomes a hit show. I'm able to travel around the world, tour, right? And it's more than that, because my tour is more than a tour. It's about an awakening. It's about a realization, like once you get there and what you feel. And so our strategy with that is different because how do you go about reawakening the world? Because the world has been through many awakenings. But how do you go about reawakening or rebirthing the world? How do you how do you get people to realize that magic stone where they can see the world in a new light? They can be reinvigorated. They have confidence. They they walk around respected in what they wear and how they talk and what they dress and what they associate with, right? They they feel you know, uh, this, this sublime feeling, you know, and this uh, regalness as you move about. And all of those worries that you had in your life, all of a sudden they disappear. And when those disappear and you are completely present, it's when you're at your highest level. So teaching people the way of thinking is a demonstration throughout this conversation, right? Like even the brother Joey Badass, I was talking to him a lot about recharging because he's just flying around. I see a lot of artists, they do these interviews even myself, we be tired a lot sometimes. And if you don't take time to recharge, the battery dies. And sometimes, you can get to recharge your battery, right? And so you have to be careful of allowing yourself to always get in that space. And you have to have a strategy of designing your life. You have the strategy of improving your life. You have to have a strategy of dealing with success. You have to have a strategy of dealing with failure. The world is changing. But when you learn the way of self, right, you learn the way of the world, you learn the ways how to change the world and learn the ways how to maintain yourself. So in this conversation, you know, for me, that was a big takeaway of seeing somebody who's similar to myself on a different path or journey, but really as black men in America, we're on the same path. We're just fighting to be ourselves and make progress for our people. And in that demonstration, you know, we become an inspiration, we become a symbol that can help lead people to the highest level. Every generation there exists tools to change the lives of those at the bottom class and at the top. These tools are things like the internet or the printing press or the light bulb. It represents innovation, paradigm shifts for generations to come. Those who have the education are able to take full advantage of the innovation by setting themselves up as the industry leaders, the most qualified and skilled so where they can teach the world what's to come because they are the ones that build it. It's starting to feel like even though you have access to all this information, most people still don't know how to use it. It's like the world is getting tested, but you need a cheat code in order to make sure that you pass it. People feel like the algorithm is against us. Well, what if I told you that we built the algorithm that was for you? In the block world order, it's about technology, it's about community, and it's about education. And giving you the opportunity to free yourself to make sure that you're not waiting on the next generation and the next tool and the next technology and the next update to be free. If you come on this journey and this ride with us, we'll make sure that you grow with us, you build with us in a manner to where you won't be left behind. There's perfection, and then there's greatness. Perfection is the state you reach, but it can never be consistent because the moment that you move is no longer in that same perfect state. Your goal is to reach greatness, but I want greatness to be normalized. I don't want it to be something that only this 1% have access to. This new 1% that runs parallel to it are those who understand how to innately tap into their gifts. See, I look at the way that the world has been created and the way that the world is consistently being ran. When you have monarchies, Monarchy they can just tell you that they bloodline are more world than everybody else. They create rules, they create seals, they put it on paper, and the rest of the world starts to follow that forever. Now that's power. 
It's not perfect, but it's great. But it's great. Now we got new systems, blockchain. These systems sit there to challenge the existing system, where new sales, new families, new records, new history can be created. But what does that matter if you're not educated and you're consistently distracted? They said because of social media, this new technology, it has actually made people more distracted and less focused. So therefore, they said the average person can only focus somewhere around seven to 10 seconds. <laughs> now for me, I think that's terrible. The reason I think it's terrible because we have access to more information than any other people at any other point in time, yet we don't know what's right, what's wrong, what's good, what's bad, what's value, and what's bull. So it's not about just having information, it's about the curation of information. Who's bringing it to you? Who can cipher it? What type of community and environment that you are in? Because growth comes from the three E's, education, exposure, and experience. See, if you can curate your education, then you can make sure that you're not just getting new knowledge, you're getting valuable knowledge that's actually applicable to your freedom and your power. You understand me? Now, the exposure is your environment because everything that you observe, you see, you feel, you hear, you become the embodiment, you vibrate at that rate. So if you're not surrounded by wealth, how can you ever vibrate, magnify, magnetize, and attract it to your reality? I was talking to my brother Idris Sandu the other day and we were talking about the difference between manifestors and alchemists. See, some people, they can drop a thought, draw it into their universe and build wealth and attract the right things to them. And other people, they work with what they have to be able to produce it regardless of where they are. See, some people, you have to understand whether you're a generator or you're a manifester and understanding your human design and your blueprint. Therefore, it gives you the right mindset. So when I say 80% mindset, 20% skill set, I mean that. But see, if you don't have the right mindset, you can't develop the right skill set. Most of you, I took courses in education and financial literacy, but when you look in your environment, you don't feel no financial liberation. We want to liberate you by helping you change the way that you think and giving you access to new education, technology, and tools that can help you enhance and give you an edge in the marketplace. You go try to try a test today in school or you can get out of high school and they tell you to take this test, you won't feel so confident. Whether it's social studies, mathematics, geography, no matter what it is. But if they tell you we'll give you the cheat codes, everybody feel like they go past it. And see, back in the day, teaching each other and giving each other the answers, they said it was cheating, they said it was wrong. But I'm here to tell you it's no longer wrong. I want to teach you how to cheat. The reason we want to teach you how to cheat because we want to give you the codes. We want to give you the answers because they've been hidden from you for so long that you deserve it. You deserve to have your mind right, your spirit right, your finances right. You understand me? You deserve a better life. But that can only come with better decisions, better investments, and better opportunities. In the Black World Order, this is what we stand for. The right community, the right education, the right technology. Through this test of life, we'll give you the cheat codes to make sure that you pass. Tap in. Come and join the Block World Order.